Welcome to tonight's meeting of the Port Phillip City Council. The City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the traditional owners of this land, the people of the Kulin Nations. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present. We acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. This meeting this evening is being conducted in a hybrid style. There'll be people that were joining us virtually online and also thank you for all of you that have arrived here this evening to speak to items in person. The meeting is streamed on our Facebook page and through our webcast page. Streams and recordings of council meetings are copyrighted and should not be altered, reproduced or published without the written permission of council. Like anything, if we experience any te technical difficulties, we may take a short break to resolve those and we'll seek to um, rectify any issues that arise quickly and prompt promptly. Now, thank you all for coming this evening. There's a lot of you to speak on a number of differing items. We greatly appreciate your participation in tonight's council meeting. Can I just remind you that any members of the public addressing council should extend due courtesy and respect to council and the processes under which we operate here. And please take direction from me as the, as the chairperson this evening when I ask you to do so. Speakers, please remain respectful and statements or questions should not be de defamatory, offensive or objectable in nature. Please also don't make any comments or make any questions that are aimed at embarrassing a councillor or a member, member of council staff. And please make sure any of your questions or comments relate to matters inside the realm of agenda items here this evening and in the realm of council. Now, I'll start by introducing our councillors this evening from Lake Ward on my left. We have Councillor Bond, Councillor Sirikoff and Councillor Copsey from Gateway Ward. We have Councillor Consolo and Councillor Martin. And from Canal Ward, we have Councillor Crawford, Deputy Mayor Baxter, and welcome back to Councillor Clark. Our presiding officer this evening is the CEO, Mr Peter Smith. Let's now move to item number one, councillors, which is apologies. We have received no apologies, so let's move to item number two, which is the minutes of the previous meeting. Councillors, the minutes of the meeting held on the 17th of August have been circulated. Do you have any questions re regarding those minutes? There being none, I'm happy to move those minutes. Do we have a seconder, please? Councillor Bond to second. I now put those minutes to you. Those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Item number three is declarations of council, um, conflicts of interest. Councillor Clark has submitted one for item 17.2. Councillor Clark. Uh, yes, thanks, Mayor. Uh, due to my uh, work commitments, I have a conflict and um, I will be stepping out for that item. Thanks, Councillor Clark, for that declaration. And we'll, we'll get you to restate that, as you've said, at 17.2. Any further conflicts of interest you wish to declare, councillors? Thank you. Let's now move to item four, which is public question time and submissions. We have a large number of people that have submitted questions um, uh, here this evening, and I'd ask you to restrict your questions or comments to two minutes, if possible, please. I know that's a short amount of time, but please keep your comments and questions succinct uh, and to two minutes to ensure that we get through everything and get to the reports uh, as soon as possible. Now, I'll start with um, some in-person people and I call upon Campbell Spence, who has submitted a question to Council. Campbell, thank you. Uh, when you get to the lectern, if you could just state your name and your suburb and your two minutes starts when you do. Thank you, Campbell. Campbell Spence from Middle Park. Uh, I have several questions tonight about the new two-tiered waste collection charge <coughs> commencing from the 1st of July this year. All properties have been charged $176.20 for waste collection and in addition waste collection charge of $88 has been levied on properties eligible for curbside FOGO collection. <coughs> Why are residents required to pay an additional $88.10 surcharge for a service that is not expected to be delivered until July, January of 2023 or later. How can the City of Port Phillip justify charging a full year's fee 
for a service that it's only planning to deliver for six months or less. Can the CEO or somebody um, provide the dates that residents will receive the new curbside FOGO bins and when will the curbside collections commence? COP is expecting to raise an additional three quarters of, of a million dollars in revenue based on the information provided that FOGO, curbside FOGO will be rolled out to 18,000 properties. Um, that's three quarters of a million dollars that I believe COP are not entitled to receive. Okay. Will Council correct this error by providing refunds? Well, will Council prorate the amount if there are delays in the rollout of the FOGO, curbside FOGO? Okay, well, I'll just correct you. I don't know if it's an error, but there's four pretty clear questions there. So why the fee, when's the bin arriving, when's the collection going, and what happens if there's delays? So, uh, do I, Chris, do I go to you or Lachlan Johnson? Lachlan, are you online? I had a feeling that was going to happen. Go organic service. Oh, hello. Uh, go hello. ahead, Lachlan. Thank you. Hi. Uh, through you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Campbell, for your question. Council is excited to be rolling out the new FOGO recycling service, which is highly valued by our community and is key to meeting our sustainability targets, such as landfill diversion. Council's been able to introduce a new FOGO and glass recycling service that will both commence this year absorb greater than rates cap increases to waste contracts, including the 19% increase in the landfill levy payable to the state government within the rates cap increase of 1.75%. Specifically to the questions that you raised, whilst the service will not commence until early 2023, council is required to include all rates and charges in the rates notices sent out to all properties in August. Council is charging the full year's fee due to the initial implementation costs of providing the FOGO service, such as one-off caddies, caddy liners. I also note that this is part, only partial cost recovery. Residents will receive their FOGO bin uh, in early 2023. We're currently working at the moment to confirm delivery dates across the city. Residents receiving a FOGO bin will be provided with further information later this year, including when the bins will be delivered and the FOGO service commencement date. The FOGO charge is part of the waste charges that have been separated from the general rates this financial year. The FOGO charge of $88.10 and the waste charge of $176.20 collectively recover the $13.7 million of direct cost for waste services for this financial year. Council has not raised additional revenue from the FOGO charge. There is no error in the curbside FOGO charge calculations and therefore a refund is not applicable. Thank you, Lachlan. I appreciate that. Just one point of the question, I'm not sure if it was answered, apology, I walked over. The scheduled collection and any delays, was that covered off on whilst I was distracted? Uh, through you, Mayor. We're working to confirm the rollout date at the moment. We've made commitments in our waste strategy that that will be from the beginning of 2023. We're working out the exact dates for when those approximately 15 to 18,000 bins will be delivered. At this point, at this stage, we don't anticipate a delay in the commencement of the service. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you, Campbell, for coming this evening. We appreciate it. I call upon Sarah Phillipson, um, who's submitted a, count, uh, a question to Council's. Hey, Sarah, welcome to Council. Just get you to state your name and suburb and your two minutes starts when you do. Sarah Phillipson, South Melbourne. Good evening, Mr Mayor and councillors. I'm here to ask about noise regulations that apply to dog parks on council land. My noise concerns particularly relate to the Eastern Road Dog Park in South Melbourne, the only fenced dog park of all the 17 off-leash parks in the electorate and by far the smallest. The noise from the park is excessive. I've been monitoring how many dogs use the park in conjunction with my neighbours, which is quite easy because we all face the park. Over a daylight period of 88 hours, spanning 17 days, we counted the number of dogs in 15 minute increments. Now over this time, the park was only empty 9.5% of the time. So that it basically means at 90% of the time, there was at least one dog in the park and you only need one dog for barking. 
33% of the time, there were five to 15 dogs in a very tiny space. Clause 52 of local law number one states that a person must not behave on council land in a manner that interferes with the quiet enjoyment, quiet enjoyment of those living in close proximity to said land. So I would have presumed this clause would also pertain to dog barking, as dogs don't turn up on their own, but I'm told it doesn't. So I'm here to get a definitive answer as to what clauses apply to noise-related dog barking on council land. And if there isn't a law, why not, given there are 17 dog parks in the city of Port Phillip? Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. Kylie Bennett, can you help us with the answer to that question, please? Through you, Mayor, and Sarah, thank you for your questions and for coming along to council uh, tonight. Sorry, is that better? Uh, so, um, through you, Mayor and Sarah, thank you for coming along to Council uh, tonight and for your questions. Uh, in relation to Council land, there is no legislation that directly deals with this particular matter. Clause 52 of Council's local law, behaviour on Council land, applies to the conduct of a person uh, and cannot be applied to uh, animal behaviour. The Domestic Animals Act 1994 does have a provision which applies to dogs barking. However, that clause is directed at the owner of land that keeps a dog on uh, the land. And being council land, uh, given that council is the owner, um, council's not keeping the dog on the land and therefore the, that particular section of the legislation doesn't apply. Uh, the Council's Animal Management Unit do what they can within available resources to patrol parks, including Eastern Reserve, uh, to ensure dogs are under effective control as much as possible. Um, I'd also add that uh, Council is undertaking a review of all current off-leash dog parks across the municipality this financial year. Uh, the feedback provided on Eastern Reserve will be considered through that process and community consultation will be open uh, later this financial year and the best way for members of our community to keep up to date um, and to uh, be advised of that upcoming consultation is to register on Council's Have Your Say. Thank you, Kylie, for that. And uh, so I just want to reiterate then if I understand... Quickly, if you could... Yes. So we can have 500 barks a day and be subjected to that and on council land and there is absolutely nothing we can do about it. Um, in terms of where well, I'm paraphrasing it, in terms of the council laws and regulations, no. But I'll, I'll ask a question in council at question time pertaining to EPA legislation. That might be something we, we, we can look into subsequently. But um, the answer, bluntly, is no. Yeah, and some of my neighbours have Thank lodged you. complaints with the EPA. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate you coming. I call upon Matt Evans speaking to item 10.1. Matt, welcome to the City of Port Phillip. Just get to state your name and your suburb and your two minutes starts when you do. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, my name is Matt Evans from Albert Park. I'm here on behalf of the Albert Park Primary School Council to express our support for uh, item 10.1, the recommendation to remove this section of Mowbray Street from Council's Register of Public Roads and also to commence the statutory procedures to, con to discontinue the road. We're now into our ninth year of the trial to use this land as sorely needed public open space and to ease ongoing pressure being experienced by Albert Park Primary School students. The school council and school community believe that now is the right time to convert the Mowbray Street pop-up park into a permanent Mowbray Street community park. We do thank council for engaging with our student leaders, school council members, our principal and staff in relation to this matter, including the need for renewal of the MOU between the school and the City of Port Phillip, which has been in place since 2016 and allows our students to use the pop-up park during school hours. This has become a valuable additional play area for our students during school hours and some of you may be aware that the Albert Park Primary School is one of the smallest schools, if not the smallest school in Victoria. In addition, we welcome and encourage use of this Mowbray Street land outside of school hours by a diverse range of users from the wider community. For example, in April this year, the Tobruk Sunday commemorative service was held in the pop-up 
park space as it is conveniently located just around the corner from Tobruk House. In summary, we're seeking a permanent Mowbray Street community park that is fit for purpose, allowing APPS students continued access to sorely needed play areas during school hours, as well as offering a significant asset for the whole community during other times. These needs, of course, were evident when our Grade 6 students presented their ideas to both you, Mr Mayor, and also to Councillor Copsey uh, when we met on site in May. In due, in due course, we hope that students' ideas for the space will be carefully considered by Council when planning and designing the space. But first, first things first, we do encourage Get Council... come to the end if you could, Matt. We do Thank encourage you. Council to support the resolution in item 10.1 this evening. And should you do so, we'll certainly make a compelling submission in during the Section 223 process. Thanks very much. No, thank you for coming this evening, Matt. Um, I call upon John Bailey speaking to item 10.5, enhancing Elwood Foreshore. John, welcome. And John's from the Elwood Tennis Club. Uh, so thank you, um, councillors, um, no and I'd like to just start by... Just get the start, oh, say your name in the suburb, it'd be great, John. Thank yeah, you. Apologies. Uh, John Bailey, um, Elwood. Go ahead. Four. Go ahead. Um, I'd just like to start by, uh, by thanking the council for their consultation with the uh, Elwood Foreshore Plan. Um, in preparing the uh, new redevelopment plan, we want to just reiterate a number of what we think are very important issues. And I'm not going to go over the, all the details that we've gone before, but I just wanted to underline those, those concerns again. I do note, um, reading through the report, that um, just under 50% of submissions um, related to the relocation of the tennis club, so it is an important issue. So um, first point, um, we're most worried about the aspect of the plan that is proposed, um, that the proposed site for the relocation of the club is too small. Um, and the wedge-shaped size is not appropriate for the, for the courts. Um, the council has been given a letter by Tennis Victoria indicating similar concerns, um, and so we have real concerns about just the um, appropriateness of the size of the plan for the tennis courts in the area that was uh, on the plan. Uh, second point, the club notes that the current plan does not include adequate space for the clubhouse. I think this is a point that's also been made by the Croquet Club as well. Um, it's, uh, it's just too small for membership and also, importantly, for storing um, equipment uh, for coaches and uh, other equipment. Uh, that's the second point. Third point, um, we're concerned about the traffic congestion caused by the existing plan. I don't think we're the only ones, not just the club, there's other um, uh, community members that are really concerned about that. We believe the additional parking along Head Street would lead to significant traffic congestion and property access issues. Um, and I think, as others have said, they suggest a, a detailed traffic plan um, would, be, uh, would be suitable for that. Um, the fourth point, um, the foreshore plan does not reflect the membership size of the club and doesn't allow for future growth. As we've said before, um, the, the club currently has 439 club members and 125 on the wait list, and that wait list has to be capped. Um, so it would be a lot higher if we just left it open. Um, so we don't think it uh, caters for current membership and also for the growth um, of the, uh, of the Thanks, club John. as well. Thanks, John. Get you to come to the end if you could. OK. And, and finally, we're, we're uh, concerned about um, potential conflicts with the existing space users and local residents. We don't want to be the meat in the sandwich if we move there. Um, we've had a lot of calls already about that. And we also are concerned about the impact of the relocation and what will it have on the club's maintenance. We need some certainty to be able to do things to the club for the safety of the members, um, as well as for the, uh, the expansion of the club. Great. That's it. Thank you very much. No, thank, thank you, you for coming this evening. We greatly appreciate it. I now go, let's go virtual. I now call upon Patrick Donovan, speaking to item 10.6, the St Kilda Triangle. Uh, hello, Patrick Donovan from South Melbourne. Um, thanks to the councillors for considering this exciting uh, opportunity for Port Phillip. According to uh, pre-COVID uh, numbers, Melbourne was the live music capital of the world with over 650 live music venues. But there was one glaring omission, a purpose-built, flexible live music venue. Sure, we had Festival Hall, but it was a boxing ring from the 50s with dodgy aircon and sight lines, which was recently sold to a religious group. So Melbourne's crying out for a 3,000 to 5,000 cap venue, as there is no currently standing, there's currently no standing venue for upbeat music events between um, 2,000 at the Forum Theatre or Market Court Arena, at the, at, uh, which is 5,000 in the city. 
I'm currently at the National Big Sound Music Conference in Brisbane, and the opening was at the ideal venue, the Fortitude Valley Music Hall. Uh, I believe the Triangle site is a perfect location for this important new venue for Melbourne. Uh, it has music history at the site. There's plenty of parking and public transport. And last year's April Sun series uh, held in the car park confirmed that fans are very happy to uh, experience music there in a beautiful setting. It could uh, host music and other events every night of the week. One promoter I spoke to said he would use it um, himself 12 times a year. It would be mainly for international acts, but also some of the bigger local acts. It would be a boon for fans, um, St Kilda residents and Port Phillip residents, and residents from afar who would travel and spend money before and afterwards in the local area on businesses. It would be a boon for the industry because promoters and bands would save money with uh, only having to put on one show instead of two shows at the Forum, um, saving on production and accommodation costs. A good example of a multi-purpose venue is the Wodonga Performing Arts Centre, which is an indoor venue, but at the wall, uh, the wall at the end can be removed so the crowd can spill outside. You can just picture this on St Kilda Beach. Um, I believe that um, uh, there's a high likelihood that this would be a viable investment proposition for the private sector, but this would obviously need to be rigorously tested. Uh, I know it's been questioned whether two venues can exist next to each other, but the Palais uh, offers a very different experience of sit-down sit shows and, um, and louder bands uh, don't really work very well there. So um, they would work well next to each other. Um, thanks, thanks well. Patrick. Can you come to the end? Yep. Uh, there's, there's also investigations for a live music precinct in St Kilda by the um, council at the moment, and this would um, help protect uh, the amenity of the area. Um, I encourage the council to uh, pursue uh, the business case uh, and do it before another Great. council leads to this opportunity. Thank okay. You. No, thank you. I call upon Serge Tierman speaking to item 10.6. Yes, Serge Thomas, thank you. Good evening, all. Uh, I understand what Patrick just said, but... Uh, uh, Anshane and myself, uh, on the 18th of August, we clearly indicated the support for that motion, but we are expressing expression, uh, we are expressing a reservation about this motion that is in front of you tonight. We believe that the feasibility work that is suggested is too narrow and does not address uh, what was approved by council in the previous master plan for the singular triangle. We also uh, believe that what is recommended is not, not properly conceived. Before doing what is recommended in the paper and before spending $700,000, I believe that council needs to first do a proper market survey and first assess if another live venue is needed in Melbourne, especially one next to the Palais. It will cost over $100 million to build with the underground car park, and we should also remember how chaotic the area was when the Palais and the Palace were working in operation. Uh, I have done my research, which I've sent you earlier today, and uh, indicated there are about there are 20 venues between 2,000 and 5 or 6,000 in Melbourne, and Festival Hall uh, is still working as an opera as as a, as a venue for live acts, especially rap music. Uh, so even if it was bought by a church, um, we. I have also spoken to several uh, industry people, promoters and, all, and others, and they actually don't support the idea of a new venue uh, being needed in Melbourne, especially one next to the Palais. Um, so as I said, I've sent you that letter. Um, we also have to take into consideration that festival not take a lot of shows away from live venues, and the current culture is to see bands and DJs at festivals, including uh, in our own Katani Garden and listen out. I got in the letterbox today. There's 15,000 people going to the Katani Garden at the end of the month. Um, with previous discussion that we had with state and federal representative, we believe the state government does not support a study just focused on only a live music venue and such a narrow uh, framework. So, Anshan suggests that for a detailed physical study, uh, it makes a comprehensive Analysis, analysis uh, of the current situation. Both the main industry body and players. Thanks, Serge. So. Get you to come to the end if I could. To assess the need of a new venue in Melbourne and Sinclair and what kind of venue. Great. Thank you very much. And I should have recognised you as a former Deputy Mayor of the City, so thank you for joining us this evening. I appreciate that. I call upon David Blakely speaking uh, to item 10.6. Hey, David, how are you? Better than I deserve. Get to state your name and suburb. David Blakely, um, St Kilda, and I'm here talking as the president of Fitzroy Street Traders and on behalf of Janet Rosenberg from Ackland Street Traders. Mayor, fellow councillors, 
Um, I moved to St Kilda for live music, and not just live music in the venues, but live music, the community it creates around live music. Um, when the Palais, or the Palace Nightclub closed probably about 20 years ago, there was a negative effect on both Fitzroy Street and Ackland Street. People would go out from the Palais after, or Palace, sorry, go out after and mix on those streets. Um, this site, the Bermuda Triangle of St Kilda, you could say, um, deserves something that's relevant to the arts. Uh, I think there is a relevancy. Um, Serge spoke about all the venues, but most of them are north of the river. Our population is mainly south of the river. Um, when it be the Palace, the Palais, the, the Mimo, the Alex, Theatre Works, the National, when those theatres have shows on, there's a positive... Event. It's not just a, a, a positive um, to traders, but it's a positive to locals. As we have people in our streets dissipate some of the social problems, um, and it makes it a happy place to live. And we fully support the motion. Um, I think it's definitely needed. I think the current plan is achievable. Some of the plans, it's certainly not Chadson by the Bay, we, we saw it many years ago, and it's achievable. I, I like the idea of a hotel on the, on the, since we've lost the, uh, the Novotel. I think that'd be a great benefit. But I think, and I think it will link the beach to, to, to Ackland Street particularly, and also Fitzroy Street. So we see great benefit in it, and we hope um, we make a start on it. Thank you. No, thank you for coming this evening, David. We greatly appreciate it. I call upon Robert Buckingham speaking to item 10.6. Welcome, Robert. Thank you. Um, Robert Buckingham, St Kilda. Um, as a resident of St Kilda for nearly 40 years, I've watched the sad decline of the area's relevance as a cultural destination and creative environment. As the previous speaker mentioned, the north side is now where all the action is. This has been, led, this has been uh, due to a number of factors, um, democratic, demographic shifts in Melbourne's population, the strength of the CBD as a magnet for young people, tourism and hospitality, and also the initiatives and incentives to attract arts organisations and arts events by councils of Melbourne, Yarra, Moreland and Darabin. The, result, the end result is that the North has become a much more exciting place for creativity and for people. Um, um, and this is reflected in the cultural, social and economic vitality of these areas compared to the city of Port Phillip. The St Kilda Triangle par par car park is an ugly blight on our suburb. It's very visible and a very public expression of the malaise that has befallen our once great suburb. I therefore sub support action to reimagine the St Kilda Triangle site, especially um, since COVID and the pandemic has radically changed the way people are thinking about Melbourne. And I think it's probably a great opportunity to take advantage of that. Further, I would like to urge councillors to recognise the social and economic importance of supporting the arts and local creative production. That's the making of art and not just simply the, um, the the production, the consumption of art, especially for the performing arts, which have such a vital part of our suburb, which are such a vital part of our suburb, and what has made it so attractive to visitors and residents alike. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We um, greatly appreciate it. Um, Juliet Ray speaking to items ten, in, item ten point seven rather, and you're joining us virtually. I am indeed. Thank you for that. Yes. Hi, my name's um, Juliet Ria. I'm making this submission on behalf of my father, Giuseppe Ria, the owner of 150 Barclay Street, um, St Kilda. Um, the heritage over overlay affects the site in part to its rear southeast corner. It's nominated on Council's heritage grading map as currently being graded significant as highlighted um, in their current plan, which hopefully everyone's got a, a picture of that in red. Um, we have understood the application of the heritage overlay to the site to be an anomaly, given it only affects a small portion of the rear. This part of the site is used for car parking, as seen um, in image three. Um, on, on behalf of my father, I've reviewed the draft consultation material and also the draft council report. I make this submission given I feel there are issues which warrant further investigation by council prior to the authorisation being sought to prepare amendment. Um, C206. There are a few issues which arise as a consequence of my review, um, and these are the issues. Number one, the draft um, 
um, Heritage Overlay Map suggests there's no change to the boundary of HO7 as it affects 150 Barclay Street. Um, in addition to that, the grading suggests that the, now the whole site is now proposed to be of mixed grade. This is at odds with the Heritage Overland, uh, Overlay Map. Um, and, and thirdly, Table 12 in the draft amendment documentation suggests that 150 Barclay Street is proposed to be removed from the um, heritage overlay entirely. So based on that sort of investigation, I, I do ask council resolve to recommend that the mapping and extent of HO7 to be further reviewed as it concerns 150 Barclay Street. In particular, I request council to resolve to remove HO7 from 150 Barclay Street. Such change reflects um, council's acknowledgement that the site has no heritage value and ensures that the boundaries of the overlay precinct follows title boundaries. That's the end of my submission. Thank you for coming this evening. We greatly appreciate it. I call upon Kerry Purcell, speaking to item 10.7. Kerry? Uh, no trouble. Michael, what was your surname? Kamari. Kamari. Please, take a seat. Just get your state your name and suburb, it'd be great. Sure. Uh, Michael Kamari from Elwood. Um, I live at 80 Mitford Street in Elwood and I'm part of a group of residents representing four properties right on the boundary of the proposed overlay and you'll hear from the other three later tonight. You'll have received a document by email from my wife Tanya Davidge today and we have physical copies for anybody who'd like one. Thank you. Um, we have a number of concerns. Our properties are right at the end of Gordon Avenue, 18 and 20 Gordon Avenue and 78 and 80 Mitford Street. Gordon Avenue has been added as a street of Federation houses. Our properties are not Federation and are distinct and different from the rest of the street. Two of them don't even face Gordon Avenue, and ours is completely blocked by a large hedge. And so we'd like to ask that that heritage criteria, the Federation Houses, be looked at. From an elevation point of view, our properties are the lowest properties in the heritage overlay, which means we're at a much higher flood risk. Um, we're also in SB01, the flood overlay, and, um, and only a handful of properties are too. We're really concerned that SB01 is not addressed anywhere in the documentation. We were millimetres from being flooded in 2011, and with the climate emergency, we expect that to become more likely. Melbourne Water says we need to raise our floor level by 40 centimetres to mitigate our flood risk. One of our key asks is to remove the properties with an SB01 until the interaction is properly addressed. Additionally, we are concerned that the policy change hidden deep in the documents that was not mentioned at all in the, the documents available during the consultation period. Contributory is a low heritage bar, but that is now going to be treated effectively the same as significant. This was hidden on page 49 of a 656 page document that was first published late on Friday. This is heritage by stealth. The, the, the headlines here are 19 significant properties, but in reality, you're adding 300. If everything is heritage, then nothing is. Uh, finally, in the case of our property, we're over 500 square metres, and so currently do not require a planning permit. After 12 years, we're ready to build our dream home, and the confluence of these issues, the heritage overreach and the flood zone, has literally turned our lives completely upside down. Uh, you know, thanks for your time. I'll hear from others later on, and you have our, our ask on the last page of the pack. I guess reiterating, you know, re reassessing the Federation houses at the end of a, a large non-Federation house at largely Federation Street, clearly, you're clearly stating interaction between SB01 and the Heritage Overlay, the policy change that says anything old and intact can't be knocked down, and addressing the Catch-22 that properties that do not require a planning permit cannot be grandfathered into the process. Thanks for being so succinct, Michael, and uh, articulate. I appreciate that. Does anybody want a copy of the... We've got it on email. You, we, we've, we, we've read it. Excellent. Uh, and we appreciate you coming so prepared. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kerry, did you want to go now? Okay, whenever you're comfortable. I don't usually flip the order around, but you seem like a nice bunch tonight. So, uh, Tanya, take a seat. Just get state your name in your suburb. That'd be great. Hi, I'm Tanya Davidge. My suburb's Elwood. Um, I'm an architect. However, I now work in community engagement. I'm the owner of 80 Mitford Street, and it's also my home. I'm deeply concerned about the heritage review process and the fact that we've only discovered in documents made available last Friday afternoon that policy changes that are planned in relation to contributory and significant properties. Our house is part of a group of properties that have been caught up in the listing of Federation houses on Gordon Avenue. The heritage review notes that this area is being listed for its Federation heritage qualities. However, our properties are not Federation. Listing our properties as contributory in this area undermines the significance of, Federation, um, of the heritage of the Federation houses, and it also values bricks and mortar over other important heritage issues such as sustainability and the heritage that we might create into the future. 
We would request that councillors move an amendment in relation to this and remove all properties in the proposed Gordon Avenue heritage overlay that are not Federation. Our houses are also in the flood zone. Our interior floor level is only slightly higher than our porch and in 2011 the flood waters were lapping at our front door. If we'd not barricaded our entry, water would have entered our home. Overlaying our houses will create a significant barrier to flood mitigation and we request that councillors move an amendment to remove all properties in SBO1 from the documents to be sent to the Planning Minister um, until a report can be undertaken to assess the impact of heritage on properties affected by SBO1. We purchased our house 12 years ago. We bought it because it did not have a heritage overlay and the block was over 500 square metres. This means we don't require a planning permit currently. In November last year, I confirmed this with council officers and informed them we were planning to knock down our house and build new. I was advised that this was fine and the heritage review was not mentioned. Since then, I've developed plans and elevations for our new house and I've spoken to architects to take this project forward. We need a new house. We have two teenagers and one bathroom. Uh, and when we bought our house, we could not afford to build our dream home. But now we're planning it and if our house is overlaid, this will no longer be possible. Um, in addition, housing prices have risen spectacularly in 12 years. Buying a new home in Elwood that meets our requirements is beyond our means. Just get you to come to the end if you could, no please. Thank you. Um, and heritage overlaying our house would effectively push us out of the suburb we love. Um, houses with planning permits have been excluded from the proposed heritage Great. overlay and we request that you exempt 80 Mitford Street from the proposed heritage overlay extension. Thank, Thank you. you. I call upon Rosemary Tovey. Hi, Rosemary, how are you? Hello. Thanks for joining us. Just get to state your name and suburb, please. Yep. Sorry, I'm a bit of a novice, so. No, My name's take your Rosemary time. Toby, and I live at um, 78 Midford Street, Elwood. Um, it's about the proposed heritage overlay. There's just a couple of things I'd like to say in my notes. We actually, um, all of us, the four of us, all support heritage listings when they are warranted. But we are arguing that our four properties do not contribute to the heritage, heritage, proposed heritage overlay. They are very different to the lovely Federation houses in Gordon Street and they should be excluded like three already have, but ours haven't. Heritage overlays can be blunt instruments, as we all know. There are inconsistencies and mistakes, such as the case with our houses. Briefly, in my case at number 78, I have an old brick unit which has been substantially modified. I feel it is unfair to require me to spend months, maybe years, of stress, uncertainty and perhaps money that I don't have. At my age, I want certainty. I need it. Um, for instance, I'm trying to get some solar panels. If this um, overlay goes ahead, I will, according to the media reports I've read, I will probably not be able to do that or at least have to go through a long, painful process. The other thing I'd like to say and make a further point is it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit of a, a thing, but if, there's, if substandard houses, which are old and have what I believe no heritage value, are included, there could well be some unintended consequences of that. By devaluing heritage overlay, the heritage overlay process and undermining public support for places that have, have authentic and genuine heritage value. Apart from these, for our individual concerns, there is a much more critical issue at stake in this municipality, and that is of climate change, which is going to have a major impact on coastal areas, not just Elwood, but your whole municipality. Only a small part of Elwood is included in this proposed overlay. And without being too dramatic, I'd like to say that I think we might be the canary in the coal mine. So we are asking council, as the other guys have said, to, remove, to move an amendment to exclude our four houses from the draft heritage overlay, as they have done for three others. Great. Just also, I'd just to finally end, like to say two sentences. Please. This will allow, if you do this, this will allow Council to focus on the more serious issue of the flood SBO1 overlay and the heritage overlay and whether they conflict and what is the impact and interaction of both overlays. Great. Thanks very much. No, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Kerry? Kerry Purcell, speaking to item 10.7. Just get to state your name and your suburb, please. Uh, it's Kerry Purcell. I'm from 18 Gordon Avenue in Elwood. Um, hi, um, again, my name's Kerry Purcell. Uh, my home is at 18 Gordon Avenue, and we have been included in the proposed new heritage overlay 
to which we object, just like Rosie, who's just spoken, and Michael and Tanya. Firstly, Gordon Avenue has been included for its Federation-style homes. According to the Statement of Significance for St Kilda Gardens Precinct, Gordon Avenue is mentioned purely for its Federation-style houses on our street. 77% of the homes on Gordon Avenue are Federation in style and look just like this. I don't know if you can see that. Yep. Our home is very different. Our home is a, is a block of three units at the bottom end of Gordon Avenue where it intersects with Midford Street. It is a block of units and it is not Federation in design, style or character. Ours is a three bedroom red brick home with a two car garage and an automatic roller door that takes up more than a third of our, the front of our property. And it looks like this. These two pictures show two very different style of homes. We have been caught up in the overlay because of the majority of the houses are Federation in style in our street. Ours is just an old red brick home. Why can't the heritage overlay boundary end where the Federation homes end? After all, the overlay extended into Gordon Avenue because of these, the very Federation homes that we're talking about. Secondly, our house is part of a flood zone. At no point in the, in the thousands page report has this been mentioned. It's obviously a very significant environmental factor to consider. Take a look at these, some of these photos from the floods in 2011 when the water was lapping up at our door. And as Tanya and Michael spoke, they live directly across the road from us. That's the view of their house and the water lapping up at their front fence. I would ask councillors to consider making an amendment to exclude our properties that are in the flood zone from the heritage overlay until a proper analysis and report can be done as to how one will affect the other. Lastly, as like most people, we have just come out of a two-year Yep, two-year pandemic, which has been both stressful financially and mentally on all of our families, and to add this burden to our properties that are deemed contributory at best, with a full heritage overlay is completely unfair. I've owned my home for 20 years and I'm ready to building okay. my family in our family home. To do this is completely unfair. Okay. So in summary, we ask you to make an amendment and remove our homes from the overlay. I think you get... We, my, my we hear you. And thank you for coming, Kerry. I really thank appreciate you. it. I call upon... Um, where am I? Matthew Curran. Hi, Matthew. How are you? Let's get you to say your name and suburb, please. I'm Matthew Curran from St Kilda. Um... I am the owner of property, uh, 151 Argyle Street, St Kilda, um, and I am very surprised that this property is uh, proposed to be heritage listed. It is not a very uh, original house. It has seen many changes. The veranda is not original. The extension at the back was from the 1980s was not in keeping with, 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 with any style. And the asbestos cladding along the side is also not original. And I am very surprised that uh, a house which is not actually um, of particular stylish, stylish build can be heritage listed, especially in view of the fact that we are in a street in Argyle Street, this is Argyle Street East, it's a section of Argyle Street east of Chapel Street, which has no, no original houses at all. There's a block of flats to the north side of the street. There's a block of flats to the south side. There's a couple of houses, one, one built in the 1980s, one built in the 1960s. We seem to be the only little house which is uh, singled out for heritage listing and we feel that if, if you're in a street where there's no other heritage listing you don't get the benefit of heritage listing because uh, technically speaking next door to you uh, you, know, uh, you know a medium density or high density development can take place whereas you are not allowed to change you know, the color of your, you know, of your weatherboards. And I feel that to be 
in a street where the majority of the houses are not actually um, Thanks, Matthew. You get to come to the end yeah, of the part of the heritage. Uh, 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 I think I would be at a real disadvantage, and I'm not, you know, against heritage listing, but it has to be worthy of heritage listing, and I, I think our property is not not worth it. Thank you. No, thank you for coming this evening. I appreciate it. Nina Zhang speaking to, speaking to item ten point seven. Hi, Nina. Hi everyone, my name is Nina Zhang. I'm from Ripon Lee. I'd just like to say that the HO7 review's recommendation to introduce a heritage overlay over my property at 12 Hotham Grove, Ripon Lee is unjustified. It is based on a defective assessment founded on inaccurate understandings of the characteristics of the property. As we have previously outlined in detail to the council, the property has undergone such significant modifications over recent years that it falls well short of the threshold of significance required for an overlay, especially an individual overlay as is being proposed. Our argument, by the way, is supported by an independent heritage assessment conducted by a heritage expert at Urbis. Furthermore, an overlay will place an impossible responsibility on the owners to preserve the property over the long term because no physical access to the western side of the house is possible due to Council's previous decision to allow a neighbouring townhouse to be built so close to our house. I have to say at this point that the process has created enormous stress on our family at a time when my husband is recovering from cancer and has had to seek additional medical assistance to deal, to deal with the stress. All the more important then for me to emphasize that the council must not adopt a recommendation which flies in the face of common sense. So with that in mind, I'd like the council to, I suppose, Tell me what they intend to, how they intend to address the issues we have highlighted. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate it, Nina. I call upon uh, Adi Harkonovic. Through you, Mayor. Uh, he was unable to attend today and has asked that I read out. Is, um, Go ahead. It's in relation to 10.8, which is Lagoon Reserve Pavilion and Sports Field Design Options. Thank you. Through you, Mayor, I've just summarised. As President for the last four years and player for the last six seasons at Port Phillip Spiders, I'd like to speak to the strength of the soccer club and the opportunity and potential for Lagoon Reserve to become a beacon of, of community sport in Port Melbourne. Playing soccer has been an integral part of life and it offered an outlet of energy and a way to build important connections outside of a difficult school environment and a way of integrating into society. The same remains true today. What the team has given me and many of the other members is a great social, physical and mental break from the everyday struggles of life. Census data says that at least 30% of Port Melbourne residents were not born in Australia, and the global language of soccer and that of Port Phillip Spiders plays an enormously important role in contributing to a strong community. While the development of Fisherman's Bend and predicted 80,000 future residents being added to the Port Phillip Bay, we must get the infrastructure in place to support and promote physical and mental health through social sports clubs like the Port Phillip Spiders. We must increase the capacity as much as possible in the municipality to build a sense of community and a sense of belonging. Over the years, we've had several mayors, councillors and upper representatives of parliament visit Lagoon and see what condition it is in. Most recently, in regard to the lighting situation, uh, there have been articles in the local magazine. Most recently, in regard to the lighting situation at Lagoon and the safety around exercise and late night walking. Thinking big picture, the World Women's World Cup is being hosted in Australia and there isn't a better time to engage young girls in the game of, so of soccer. In summary, the Lagoon Reserve has been waiting since 2013. Council review for a redevelopment. Federal funding was awarded long before that as the soil is contaminated, but we still have been using the ground nonetheless. With all of the mentioned reasons, the redevelopment of Lagoon, I can only see a positive impact on the community, mental and physical health. 
Thank you. I call upon Una Steele speaking to item 10.9, pop-up bike lines. No, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good evening. Una Steele, St Kilda East. Uh, we attended the last meeting regarding the pop-up lanes with huge opposition from your constituents. After the meeting, I rode the whole length of these lanes with other experienced cyclists. I did not influence the other riders, who were all absolutely horrified. I then submitted a detailed evaluation to all councillors and other groups. Since then, members of numerous bike groups have also ridden these lanes with the same negative opinion. However, it is good news that some streets are to be reinstated back to normal. But it is not enough. And the worst street of all, Westbury, is not included. The executive summary states that no high-risk items were identified by DOT auditors. Absolutely incredible. We have to assume that these auditors are not cyclists. The majority of these lanes are high-risk items. Can you imagine riding into those concrete slabs at speed? The proposal from DOT to monitor the trial on Westbury sadly indicates a lack of concern regarding everyone's safety. The option to explore alternative designs can only mean the removal of parking spaces. Westbury Street has numerous apartments and units. To remove parking would impact hugely on the elderly, disabled and young families. And for what purpose? Until recently, many of these streets were perfectly safe to ride, day or night, and it certainly has not encouraged more cyclists to use them, quite the reverse. These lane issues are not about party politics, they are about safety for all road users, pedestrians, cyclists and drivers alike. The trials on Westbury and our local streets need to end and for them to be reinstated back to their original road configuration. The streets have been decimated and need to be given back to the community. Thank you. Thank you. I call upon Peter, Pete Crashow, speaking to item 10.9. Hi, Pete. Welcome. Hi. Just get to state your name and suburb, and your two minutes starts when you do. OK, I'm Pete. Um, I live in Westbury Street. Uh, I've been a ratepayer for 21 years. I own six push bikes. Pete, just get uh, ask you to do your surname as well, if you could, please. Uh, Peter Crashow. Thank you, mate. Uh, I own six push bikes. So I hear there's a discussion to improve the new hazardous bike lane that is stuck in the middle of Westbury Street. There is talk that car spaces will be reduced to cater for the revision. Uh, will there be any consultation with the residents moving forward? Uh, will this be the same consultation that occurred with the pop-up bike lane to begin with? Are people that the people making these decisions are aware that there aren't enough parking spots in Westby Street right now. We actually need more parking spots, not less. Trying to find a car park post 6.30 p to 7 p.m. is near on impossible. So I'll just give you some statistics. In the 200 metre stretch of Westbury Street in between Inkerman and Elmer Road, there's 318 dwellings in total. One apartment block, number 68, has eight apartments with no off-street parking. So that leaves 310 dwellings with off-street parking. There are 74 available parking spots on Westbury Street, so practically eight from number, 60, from number 68 with no off-street parking leaves us 68 available parking spots. Going back to the remaining 310 dwellings, let's say 1.75 people live in these apartments, it gives us 556 occupants. Let's say 80% of those 556 occupants have cars, that is 445 cars, subtract the 310 off-street parking, leaves us potentially 135 cars looking for 68 parking spots. Um, so, um, sorry for all that statistics. Um, so we've already opened up a Pandora's box with the bike, bike lane, so why open up another Pandora's box by removing the car spots? So having said all this, I have concerns for my female neighbours, of which one lives, is with me tonight. Um, so removing the parking spots will mean that she would have to probably drive, uh, park at least maybe a kilometre away from her house if we lose the parking spots. So for her to be parking so far away from her home at night, walking back to her house is unsafe. So let's work together. I've got some ideas. 
Let's just remove the middle, medium strip and have the bike lane on the left-hand side of the car lane like any other normal street in That's Melbourne. That's great. Get you to come to the end, Pete. OK. Um, look, we've got some other ideas, but I just want to do a quick survey. Who in this room rode their push bike yeah. tonight? Oh. Raise your hands. No one? Well, Councillor Copsey is the first time Councillor Copsey hasn't ridden in a long time, but she um, got a scooter. Um, now, so, Pete, I've got a councillor that wants to ask you a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, you talk about the uh, number of cars, ownership of cars and in the area. What is the pressure on car parking at the moment for um, yeah, people in that area? So when I get home tonight and Jessica, who I invited to come along, we're going to be racing home to see who gets that possible parking spot. It's any, I invite any one of you people to drive down Westbury Street about 6.30 to 9 o'clock and have a look, and there are zero parking spots. OK. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you much. for the question, Councillor Sirikoff. Um, Campbell Spence speaking to item 10.9. Welcome again, Campbell. Yeah, great. Thanks again, Mayor. Pleasure. Um, I'm Campbell Spence from Middle Park. I'd like to thank councillors who voted on the 20th of July to reverse or modify some of the pop-up bike lane infrastructure in Port Phillip, specifically Bridge Street, Nelson Road, Armstrong Street, Lyon Street between Bridge Street and Esplanade, and two intersections on Marine Parade. Tonight, councillors are expected to formalise those changes, but the rollback doesn't go far enough. The proposed changes only impact four kilometres of the 38 kilometres, or about 10% of the installed pop-up bike lanes. 10% is not enough when the community backlash against the pop-up infrastructure is ongoing and has not died down. Our community is continuing to express concerns about the confusing and unsafe road infrastructure in other sections of the 38 kilometres. I'm also concerned about the council officers recommending the removal of car parking in Bridge Street, Port Melbourne, and in Westbury Street, as some of the speakers have just mentioned, and um, the recommendation that councillors have been given an option not to reinstate the left-hand turn from Bridge Street into Bay Street. Our community is continuing to question why DOT and council believe these pop-up bike lanes are necessary when we have some of the widest and safest streets in, uh, in Melbourne. We have these are quiet residential streets, so w why are bike lanes installed in streets such as Page Street, Park Road, York Street, Middle Park and West St Kilda? The treatments on Marine Parade, Westbury Street are dangerous. The bike infrastructure is ideologically driven assault on our amenity by people with no direct state stake in our community. Okay. I'm, I'm therefore hey Campbell, advocating we're, we're crossing. I know it's your opinion, and you're entitled to your <coughs> opinion, but um, I'll ask you to sort of stick to the facts and not yeah. be quite as personal as you just have been. Thank you. Mary. I mean, 30 seconds ago. So, so I'm asking for the reinstatement of Westbury Street uh, without removal of car parks, uh, the reinstatement of Marine Parade at all intersections, uh, the intersections in Park Street and Mill Street, intersections on Locke and York Streets with Deacon Street and the intersections on York and Cowdroy Streets and the intersection on Park Road and McGregor Street. So I urge Council to listen to the community, uh, to the community who have legitimate concerns. Thank you. Get thank come you. To the end. I call upon Julie Clutterbuck speaking to item 10.9 also. Julie, you're here. I haven't seen you tonight. Uh, May, uh, sorry. Um, oh, there you Julie, are. Julie, Julie, did, Julie did text me to say that um, she'd gotten which town hall we were going to be at mixed so up. So she's writing over here. That, <laughs> asked that, uh, that her statement come? be read out by an officer, if that's OK. Yeah, I'll allow that. If we have it, we don't have anything here. Do we have a statement? OK, we'll, we'll keep going and we'll, we'll see what we can find in that respect. I call upon Cameron Smith, has been at item 10.9, pop-up pop up bike lanes. Cameron, welcome. Just get to state your name and suburb, that'd be great. Thank you, Mayor. Cameron Smith, South Melbourne. 
So thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, and I've got Pleasure. questions pertaining to two themes in respect of the pop-up bike lanes. So theme number one. Per clause 5.35 of the distributed agenda item 10.9, we can read that the pop-up treatment has not led to a significant change in the level of protection for bike riders. And this is in reference to the Nelson Road area. Clearly, more treatments may also be found to be like this across the city of Port Phillip and therefore also be sought for removal. Noting the concept of these pop-up bike lanes as being temporary, can Council please confirm that it has confirmed with the Department of Transport that a fully funded budget exists for the removal of the remaining pop-up bike lane infrastructure? i.e. for the benefit of residents and ratepayers, this statement should be on record to Council from the Department of Transport and therefore in the future, particularly post a state election, we should not be exposed to a lack of budget excuse for the removal of the infrastructure. Okay. Yep. Theme two. From my research and reading, I understand that the pop-up bike lane infrastructure is temporary and therefore no Council permit was necessarily, necessary, explicitly sought and or provided. To this end, should any aspect of the pop-up bike lane program become permanent, and we clearly don't think that should be the case, but then I understand a permit will be required from Council if something becomes permanent. So noting that the pop-up bike lane program has a 12 to 18 month potential duration, can Council please explain or articulate the process of assessing a permit application once received and which body or party within Council has responsibility for approval, i.e. does it remain with the Council officer or team, does it go to the councillors or does it come to a public meeting such as this for discussion and debate? Thank you. Great. We'll make sure uh, a councillor may take those questions up when we get to item 10.9. I call upon Louisa Williams speaking to item 12.1, which is the event strategy and outdoor events policy. All right, Thanks, and you're, uh, you're online. Hello, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor and Councillors. I, my name is Louisa Williams from Port Melbourne. I'm speaking on behalf of 44 townhouses that border Post Office Place, Dow Street and Row Street. Uh, we're responding to the shutdown of the lane between Bay Street and Post Office Place. It has no name, um, but it's been sought by the local. This is the third year that there is a shutdown being requested. The first year, we were told, was uh, permitted solely because of COVID purposes. We had a second year shut down for four months, again with the excuse of COVID, and assured that this would no longer take place beyond COVID. We're now in our third year. There's been a shutdown requested for the entire long weekend for the grand final um, with the full lane shut. Uh, we were not informed um, prior to approval. Um, and we have concerns. The local is a two... Can you hear me? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Sorry, I can hear a lot of background noise. Um, the pub is a two-storey building. Uh, so there are two storeys that they can cater to their patrons, plus they have Bay Street frontage, plus they're also an extensive chain of pubs that includes the beach exchange, uh, the exchange that also hosts the beach exchange on the Dog Beach over summer. So they're not shy of public space. We're very concerned about emergency vehicles uh, who cannot access our property from Bay Street, as well as Row Street bottlenecks. So again, you can't turn right from Row Street, you have to do a U-turn. There are bottlenecks at the best of times. This is going to create more issues. There are impacts caused by the pub closing the lane to both the schools, um, Albert Park College campus, and the gym. They can speak to, to their own issues, but they are concerned about um, various things. We have dealt over the years uh, with traffic issues, antisocial behaviour, including urinating on uh, building walls, vomiting on private cars and drug deals, as well as noise and rubbish uh, with bottles left around the buildings. And it's not limited to solely those. We've got many, many photos and videos that have been sent to council, and we're wondering if they've been great. circulated If to I could get you to come to the end, Louisa, that'd be great. Sure. We'd like to know why the, the views of the residents are being ignored, because there has been extensive information contributed by an 44 residents. Okay. Um, we also would like to know where else are residential streets being shut down for the purpose of a pub extension, All right. and why residents are not being notified or having a say. 
Okay, we'll take those questions on notice and a councillor may raise those when we get to that item. I call upon Martin Carr, speaking to item 14.1, notice a motion. Hi Martin, how are you? Good, thanks. Martin Carr from St Kilda, in relation to the motion from Councillor Bond. Councillor Bond's motion mentions that a new parklet guideline is currently being created. The facts at the moment is that the current published guidelines and application form for parklet renewals clearly states that before you start, and before you start, make sure you have obtained consent from affected landowners before applying. This relates to renewals as well. The body corporate does not consent and has put this in writing. The current application is not valid and the business should be instructed to remove the structure. The supporting information in the motion states that the apartment building is immediately to the rear. In fact, two of the three car spaces presently being utilised are located directly in front of the apartment entrance and not in front of the cafe as inferred by the motion. The supporting information ignores the impact on access and amenity. The commercial properties in the immediate vicinity rely on short-term parking. Takeaway chicken shop, sex shop, bakery and cafe Banff operate a takeaway business that is reliant on drivers collecting and delivering their orders. The removal of three short-term car spaces is contributing to drivers making poor parking choices, including unauthorised use of the loading zone, disabled car park and obstructing the driveway which accesses the resident's car park. The blocking of the driveway to the apartment is actually becoming a real issue. Unlike the apartments on Fitzroy Street, we do not have access via the rear lane. I have photographic evidence of 42 incidences where people have not been able to access or enter the car park. Prior to the parklet, we only have a record of two incidences. The problem is so acute that I've had to purchase a visitor's car space to actually be able to park within the area if I come home and I cannot enter my car park. The present parklet stretches across the entire property frontage, preventing any direct access to the kerb. This not only impacts the aesthetics of the deco building, it also creates complications for emergency vehicles to service the property. Removal trucks are forced to park 100 metres away to be able to actually access our building. As there is no kerb access, there's no location for the cafe to place their industrial size waste bins for collection, they now resort to leaving these out the front of our neighbouring residences at 139 and 149 Fitzroy Street without their permission. Once they're emptied, these become hazards and they're left in the car space that's available. In summary, the current guidelines require that the owner consents as this, and this has not been given. The body corporate believes that the existing permit for 21 outdoor spaces is sufficient. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. I appreciate you coming this evening. I call upon Fiona Williams, speaking to item 14.1 also. Fiona? No, Fiona? Oh, um, we've got a statement there. We'll add that to the summary pack, if that's OK. If Fiona's not here. I call upon Paul Malcolm, speaking to item 14.2. Paul, welcome. How are you? Great, thank you. Uh, so Paul Malcolm here on behalf of Port Melbourne Football Club. Um, we're here to firstly endorse and support the, this motion for uh, the review of the sporting field. Um, over, we're very happy also to take part in any of those reviews as an end user um, and to provide feedback accordingly. Over the last year and a half, we've raised many concerns around the condition and maintenance of North Port Oval and, to a lesser degree, Murphy's Reserve. And it should be also noted that over the last two years, there's been a limited use by organised sport during, due to COVID of these venues, so they should still be in high standard. Given the large investment has been made across the venues over the years, the upkeep and maintenance needs to be maintained to a much better standard. This will therefore allow community members and sporting clubs to be able to use better quality venues and help to in limit injuries and other is issues around access. That's all for that one. Thanks, Paul. Any questions, councillors? No? OK. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate you coming this evening. Um, call upon Christine Evely. 
Christine hasn't joined us this evening. Okay, Council has given us a reasonable number of people here and we've been going for an hour and 15 minutes. We've received 18, uh, sorry, 11 written submissions and I'm going to ask officers to substantially shorten these down um, into the key sentiment and any questions to be read out quickly. You've got them in front of you, so you, if you haven't had a chance to read them fully, you have that chance now whilst we're being read out. They're not all that long, uh, but just in the interest of saving time, that's what I've instructed uh, or requested officers to do. Um, Joe McNeil, if you could start that process and be as brutal as you wish. Thank you, Mayor. Through you, uh, from Michael Strugnell. My part uh, regarding the dog off leash. As a long term resident, I have observed the park transform from an open community garden to an overused and badly maintained dust or mud pit. Over the years, I have witnessed mistakes in park maintenance which have been at enormous cost to Council. Two questions Why is Council so intent on keeping this small park in this location rather than seeking a better place for it? And secondly, if the EPA has a recommendation that a commercial dog kennel must not be located within 500 metres of a residential area, can, how can the City of Port Phillip in all good conscience allow residents within 500 metres of this park an open air kennel to bear the brunt of the constant noise? Thank you. I'm satisfied to take the questions from Adrian Jackson on notice and we can apply, uh, reply to those on email. Um, so let's now go to... Um, Glenn's Fraser, I think, is the next one at 10.5. Through you, Mayor. As a resident for almost 30 years, we're strongly opposed to the proposed additional parallel parking and flow-over flow car park accessible from Head Street. Over time, Head Street has become extremely popular by vehicle and foot traffic, by users of the foreshore, and this creates a dangerous tension between these types of uses. Unfortunately, the format of the Have You Say consultation did not seek to elicit issues along safety and welfare lines. We believe Head Street's Sorry. history justifies our concern that proposed development, which would increase the amount of traffic, will revive and exacerbate these types of problems. A problem, and there's also a preference there for option one over option two. Um, David Brand for item 10.6. Have I got the wrong one? Oh, uh, my apologies. Uh, and that, just ignore what I just said because that was I was talking to Christina Sink, um, Kingst. So item 10.6 10 also, pardon me, it's the bottom of my page. Through you, Mayor. The three-week delay to bring the St Kilda Triangle report back to Council has produced a cheaper feasibility study option, option two. Option two raises concerns about cost-cutting by our mid-term Council. Community engagement, a key pillar of local democracy, is one of the first casualties. To proceed with the feasibility work properly as per option one and explain your public to your public why spending an additional 558000 now is a good idea given you have just commissioned a 70k cost cutting review or to defer this work, the proper work of option one to a future time for example when council receives the report of the cost cutting review. Now let's go to David Brand. Through you, Mayor, the Triangle site is Melbourne's most significant public space development opportunity. To realise its full potential as an iconic public space and cultural precinct, it requires a fully coordinated, visionary, multifunctional development proposal. To explore this possibility uh, of at both a temporary structure as well as a long-term option, a clause worded along the following lines should be included in the motion. Including this feasibility, the study, an option of a temporary or placeholder facility which could, in say five to 15 years time, be readily removable to allow for the site to be developed to its full potential as a cultural complex and major public space when resources for this eventually become available. Great, we're on to Joel um, Burstiner. Through you, Mayor. At each turn in this process, the notice periods have been unreasonably short and prevented me properly preparing a response informed by expert advice. I seek more time to prepare a response prior to any heritage overlay being imposed on the property. Thank you, Jan Talico. Uh, that's in relation to item 10.9, pop-up park, pop, pop bike lines, rather. Through you, Mayor. I was shocked and appalled by the installation of more than 30 kilometres of pop-up infrastructure. The infrastructure is misconceived, unnecessary, and increases risks. I'm a 30-year resident. I'm also philosophically in favour of sustainable transport. Great. Sarah Crow-West. 
Through your Mayor, the additional two parklets most definitely create additional impact on access and amenity to the entire apartment complex, 145 Fitzroy Street, which is blocked from the streets by the parklets. Thank you. Fiona Williams. Through you, Mayor, I'm a resident of 145 Fitzroy Street and I disagree with Councillor Bond's motion. It is untrue that residents are not significantly impacted by the loss of the three short-term parking spaces in question. Thanks, Joanne. Let's now move to item five, councillors, which is councillor question time. Councillors, what questions do you have of officers at this evening's meeting? There being none, let's... Um, Oh, that's right. Julie, pardon me. There was one statement which is waiting for someone to arrive late and they didn't arrive. So let's just go back to statements if we could. Julie Cutterba Cuttlebuck rather. Cutterbuck rather, has um, issued a statement. Through you, Mayor. I'm writing about the agenda item to remove many parts of the pop-up bike infrastructure trial. The listed items go much further than the items you listed in the motion passed at the July meeting. I think most would agree the changes are ugly, but the purpose of the changes is to make it safer for people on bikes. I am asking you to allow the trial to go ahead and make your decision at the end of the trial period after reviewing the available evidence. Is there anybody else that we've missed? No? Okay. Let's move now. I'll just... Sorry. Have you registered to speak? I have not. Okay. Then we haven't missed you. You've missed the cut-off time. I'm going to keep moving if that's okay. So, councillor question time at item number five. Councillors, any councillor questions? All right. Now, let's move. Before we move, let's go to item six, rather, the sealing schedule. There's no items that are on tonight's agenda to seal. So, and moving to item seven, which is petition and joint letters. Councillors, we have no petition or joint letters on tonight's agenda. Before we move to item... Items 8 through 13, I'd just like to suspend standing orders for a moment to acknowledge that this is our CEO, Peter Smith's final council meeting with the City of Port Phillip. No worries. It's been, a, it's been a wonderful year. I'm just trying to rack my brain when you commenced with the City of Port Phillip. 2016, 17, you were, it's 2017 you were appointed, were you? Correct. May. May 2017. So you've been a long-serving uh, servant to the people of the city of Port Phillip. We sincerely appreciate the work ethic that you've brought to the city, uh, the passion you've brought to both the areas of your interests and also the council plans which you've implemented under the previous term and developed and commenced the implementation of under this term of council. We wish you all the very best uh, with your new role with the city of Darabin and uh, we look forward to you continuing to advocate for items which are dear to your heart and also very much aligned with the councillors you sit here. So on behalf of the council staff, on behalf of the community, on behalf of the councillors here, thank you for your service to the city and all the very best for your future. Well done. Councillors, if you'd like to say a few words, please feel free to do so now, and that gives the CEO a little bit of time also to respond. If you'd like to say some words, please do so. Councillor um, Baxter, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, uh, Mr. Mr. CEO Peter, um, I uh, I also wanted to, to, to just thank you uh, for your service. In particular, I wanted to point out um, that during uh, the the height of the pandemic and the and the lockdowns, um, that the sort of uh, pressure that that all of our staff and and council were under, but but particularly the CEO of this organisation, in order to continue to keep. Uh, the organisation running to provide support to our community to keep people fed in some instances um, and uh, everything that, that had to go through that I, I genuinely was in awe of, um, of the, the, your, your good spirits and your, uh, not, as well as your, your ability obviously in, in undertaking that work uh, and that's something that, uh, that I think if, if we had had a uh, a lesser CEO, perhaps there, you know, that we may not have um, gotten through it as well as we did. Even though, of course, our community and council are still scarred from from the pandemic and lockdowns. I think we did um, amazingly well there, and that's, I think, a testament to your work. I don't want to single just that out, of course, just the hard times, um, that, but uh, that is certainly uh, one thing that I think of in terms of um, the the amazing value this community has gotten out of your work. So. Thank you, Mr. CEO, and all the best in your future endeavours. And um, you're not allowed to be a stranger. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. 
Councillor Martin. Um, I've been working with our CEO for the last five years because for many years I was a school principal and I found Peter as the CEO of the City of Port Phillip very, very supportive of me and my community at the Port Melbourne Primary School and also someone who worked very closely with me on improving sporting facilities, particularly at the Port Melbourne end of the community. So as a ratepayer and you know, local, local official, thank you very much. As a member of council, I know what it's like to have to work for a council with a, a range of diverse views and you have managed to keep yourself in Switzerland dealing with the various different perceptions that we all have of how things go and in the middle of all this trying to deal with nine very very different people and um, trying to treat us all equ with equanimity to lead council through the COVID years was an amazing feat so yes again I wish you well and thank you for your support both in my role before I came on council and as a councillor. Thank you Councillor Martin. Anybody else? Yep, okay. Councillor Crawford. Yeah, I don't want to make it long. And um, I think the thing, Peter, there are many things, and I'll write a lot of them in the card, but I do think the two things on the table, like Dar um, our loss is Darabin's gain, but particularly your ability to think big and the big picture, but also the, your ability to, um, your strategic mind around when a problem presents, how do we pivot, how do we get through it? And people won't see the work that you've done behind the scenes quietly, um, with managers, with councils, with all of the officers, and that ability to bring the team together but also strategically work our way through things, and things are not easy. There's often complications and there are often wicked problems that we have to solve or try to solve a little bit on the way. So, Peter, thank you very much for everything you've given to the city. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Um, right of reply. Mr. CEO, oh, Councillor Copsey, go ahead. I'll just sneak one in. Thank you. I just echo all my fellow councillors' comments. Peter, it's been an, an absolute privilege to work with you. Thank you so much for everything that you've given the city. Um, we brought you on board looking for someone with wisdom and experience in local government, and you absolutely have brought that. And I think um, what I hope you'll take from this is some pride around some of the incredible... Um, projects that have been able to be advanced during your time here. Um, I'm thinking particularly in the housing space. We will have um, literally homes built that will be um, there because in large part of the effort that you've gone to to implement Council's vision. So I really hope that um, I'll think of you when I see those and that, that the, um, you'll take great pride in the huge practical benefit that you've made to people's lives in this city during your tenure here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, CEO, right of reply. Go ahead. I'll be very, very, very brief. Um, thank you, Mayor and Councillors, for your kind words. Um, it would be remiss of me not to recognise that as CEO, uh, I've been honoured to and humbled to be in charge of an amazing organisation of people who um, have made this particular CEO look very good just because of their awesomeness. Um, a place particular thanks to my executive team in various shapes and forms over the last five years who are just uh, an amazing team and no more so than I think when we had so much work to do in the pandemic, not just to keep the organisation running, to support council, but most importantly keep our support and services going to the community. So I'd be remiss not to recognise my colleagues. I also want to recognise those in the community who we've partnered with or, and, and have reached out to me over the last five years. This is an amazing municipality, a great community. You've got wonderful things in your DNA. It's been an absolute pleasure to work in this city. And I wish you all the very best and Council all the very best um, for a thriving, vibrant, viable city where we're no longer talking about COVID but just enjoying the beautiful place that is the city of Port Phillip. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, CEO. <laughs> Councillors, let's now resume the meeting. We're on to items 8 through 13, which is the presentation of reports. I'm going to change the agenda based on the, the people we have in the audience tonight. And just a note, we're moving items 10.1, 10.2, 10.4, 13.1, 13.2, 13 13.3 and 13.4 on block, which we'll do after the motions. I'm also going to edit the or alter the uh, agenda um, order to make sure we're considering items uh, based on the number of speakers we've had here this evening. So the first item I'm going to do is 10.7, followed by 10.9, just to give the um, officers a heads up, 10.7, followed by 10.9, followed by 10.6. So, councillors, let's now move to 10.7, which is the review of heritage overlay 7 and surrounds, amendment C206... 
Uh, yeah, we can take a break, actually. Yep. Let's do that. So we'll re resume at 8 o'clock or a little bit past 8 o'clock. So take a break. Sorry to keep everyone waiting, but... Um, there was a small um, error with the order of speeches that was provided. We missed somebody. So um, Mary... Mary, how do I pronounce your surname again, Mary? Larecki. Mary Larecki uh, is here to speak for two minutes on which item, Mary? Uh, oh, it's in relation to the proposed heritage overlay on um, a property known as 342 Carlisle Street. Great. In okay. If you just date your name in your suburb and your two minutes starts when you do. Um, yep. Mary Larecki, Balaclava. Great. I'm here to speak on behalf of um, the owners um, of the property known as 342 Carlisle Street in Balaclava. Um, the council proposes to include this property in the Heritage Overlay 7. Um, there is a pr proposed citation, citation number 2443, and that citation um, includes that the property is to be graded as significant. Um, having had a look at um, the citation in detail. Um, I believe the citation struggles to justify um, any significance on this building. The building was built circa 1960. Uh, it forms part of um, a very typical style of building um, which um, happened in the 60s boom flat building era in the area. Uh, and we all believe that um, the, um, the grading of um, the property as significant and ha putting a heritage overlay over the property places, an, how can I say, an unfair burden on the owners of the property. Thanks, Mary. I appreciate you coming. And thanks for um, drawing that error to our attention. No it's important to hear from you. Thank you. All right, councillors, we're at item 8.1. Sorry, pardon me. We're at item 10.7, which is the review of Heritage Overlay 7 and Surrounds. Uh, councillors, do you have any questions of the officers in relation to this item? Councillor Crawford. I have quite a few, if I may, because I know that we've had a few meetings. Keep them going, yeah. Okay, so the first one I want to clarify is, um, uh, is the um, kind of clarification in the document or the planning amendment around that significant and contributory buildings in terms of demolition. Um, is that a new uh, clause that we're adding or is that something just clarifying what has already been current policy for a long time? Thank you, Brian T. Uh, thank you and through uh, you, Mayor. Uh, the uh, report... Um, Could you turn the microphone up a little bit? Sorry, Brian, I can't quite hear. I'm... Thank you. Is that clearer? Yeah. Um, the, the report does have the definition of contributory and uh, significant uh, in terms of uh, the heritage status of a building. Uh, the report does not recommend and does not contain any substantive change. It is policy neutral. Uh, what it does do uh, is it clarifies that uh, only individual properties will be um, identified as significant um, and no longer will individual properties be identified as contributory uh, in the policy. But the outcome, the application of those tests, how they will be applied to properties will not be changed as a result of this decision and this report. Yeah. Councillor Crawford. Um, so I know that there has been a concern, particularly um, in Elwood, that some of the properties lie in low-lying areas and that flooding is a major issue. Um, I guess where there is concern about how, how does the heritage overlay and the need you know, to deal with flooding, um, uh, uh, how can that be managed? Um, is that something that we are looking to do? Or could you explain a little bit about how that might work together and what we might do in the future? Thank you, Brian T. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, the um, issue with flooding and heritage and how those two policy outcomes intersect uh, is an area that um, we, will, we are currently doing work on and will continue to do work on and will work with Melbourne Water um, so that from a resident perspective, um, the conflict in terms of the applications of those various policies 
are resolved um, as part of the development and, and implementation of this policy. And we will come back to uh, council for a council decision prior to the finalisation of uh, these, um, the heritage in relation to these properties, so that when uh, we, when uh, the, so, so that if the next council report will ensure that we address uh, any um, inconsistencies in the application of those two policies as part of the um, recommendations in relation to the final heritage listings of any of the properties. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Then we'll go to Councillor Baxter. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you ask your one. Um, just the other one was, um, so in regards to solar panels, obviously on heritage, um, I, I think there is some, on, um, I was not clear myself today, that there is some um, idea that we are really restrict, but I guess I was wondering if perhaps the only angle of um, a building to put solar panels on the front of a heritage building, do we allow to that conversation? What is the process? Bronte, sorry, pardon me. Thank you, um, Mayor. In terms of um, solar panels, and again, as uh, with the previous question, uh, there, sometimes there is a conflict in terms of policy considerations, in this case, sustainability or the environment, as against the heritage, heritage listing of the property. Uh, Council uh, in, has resolved that conflict um, and does have guidelines. Uh, those guidelines provide that uh, if a um, owner of a property that is heritage listed would like to have solar panelling or indeed a water tank, um, that the um, preferred outcome is for those for that uh, solar or indeed the water tank to not be seen from the, the streets to preserve the streetscape. Um, that is the preferred outcome. However, uh, where that outcome cannot be achieved, um, then, and, and Council will deal with this on a case-by-case -case basis, but where that cannot be achieved, then the solar panels will be able to be um, located where they are required to be located. Thank you. Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I think it's a, a common conception among uh, a lot of the community that a, that a, a heritage overlay can um, trump uh, other other uh, overlays or, or, or policy um, objectives, uh, and and be quite uh, restrictive in terms of a number of activities that people might want to undertake on their on their property. Um, the, my question is about where where you have some of those those conflicts, such as as you just described, as a conflict between um, a heritage, uh, you know, a, a, a heritage. Uh, our desire to, to maintain heritage and our desire to, to um, encourage sustainability, or another conflict that springs to mind from Councillor Crawford's uh, questioning being uh, a desire for us to maintain heritage but a desire to maintain flood resilient homes, for example. Um, in practice, how do we resolve those, those sorts of, of, of conflicts? And is it the case that, that, that a heritage overlay simply trumps all the other and you can't do anything? Bronte. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. And um, uh, a heritage overlay um, does not trump everything. Um, what we would encourage um, community members who've got a heritage overlay who would like to do, say, for example, um, renovations or a redevelopment, uh, we would encourage them to come to council offices um, our intention is always to balance the competing interests to make sure that the heritage value and integrity of the heritage is maintained. And consistent with that, and as much as we can, we would seek to accommodate and balance um, the desires for the um, owners to um, modify their property. Thanks. Um, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so just... Following on from some of the information you provide us, Brian, as an example that if, um, if you wanted to renovate your home and it's currently not fit for the flood requirements, as in it's level with ground, how would the council treat a proposal like that um, if you, you then needed to renovate the full house, just to give people some understanding? Brian T. Um, thank you. Um, 
so I think the issue would arise, so if in, this is the issue that arises where there is a um, two um, policy objectives, heritage and the flood overlay. Um, and it would arise where, um, well, if uh, at, at one extreme, where as a result of a flood event, the house is no longer structurally sound, in, in which case, um, despite any heritage overlays, if the house is not structurally sound, a demolition um, um, permit would be uh, provided. Um, the other uh, the other area might be where uh, if you are in a flood overlay and you want to um, modify your property, you want to add an extra room and that um, may be consistent with the heritage overlay um, but might require as a result of the flood overlay for you to have an elevated um, a podium on which to build in order to minimise the loss of the flooding. Um, that's another example, and I think the third sort of example is the example where a homeowner um, who lives in a flood overlay would like to would like to modify their property so that they can reduce the uh, risk of flooding by, for example, building a, a, a podium or some other structures. Um, those two issues are issues that again we try and accommodate on a um, case by case basis. Um, we are also working as part of this policy development with Melbourne uh, Water. It is not our intention for uh, homeowners to or um, to be caught between two policy outcomes that they cannot both meet. So, um, part of this process that we're initiating uh, tonight um, is to engage with uh, Melbourne Water and to come back to council with. Um, uh, um, and, and seek council law in, um, endorsement for guidelines or other principles that we would then use as council officers when confronting those two competing um, uh, policy objectives. Just a couple more, if that's okay. Uh, the other one was raised in similar to the solar panels in skylights. Is that still allowed? Can someone put in a skylight? Brian T. Come back on that one. <laughs> Norris, I might take that one on. And sorry, the final one. Um, just, what is the policy by which council excludes some properties when they are introducing a heritage overlay like this? Brian, can you help us out? Um, thank you, and thank I, you. I can confirm that the um, skylights are treated in the same way as uh, water tanks and solar, and that is, um, we would. Um, um, seek that they um, be not visible from the street, essentially. Um, however, if um, uh, that is technically not feasible or the location is such that they need to be, uh, then that is, uh, that is something that we would allow uh, in terms of the implementation of this um, policy. Um, in terms of uh, the exclusion, and it's always uh, difficult when you introduce a policy like this because the moment you introduce a policy like this, people who are living in those properties, who bought properties that were not heritage, uh, are now covered by the heritage um, requirements. If we um, proceed tonight, then it's always difficult to know where you where you um, cut off that um, that line. Um, in the development of this policy, what we've had a look at is for all properties that. Um, have, are of heritage value, but have already got an existing permit, or have got, um, or have um, made an application. Um, we have excluded those uh, heritage listed properties from uh, consideration for this evening, and we have not included. We've not. Re we have not recommended that they be um, protected through the heritage overlay. Thank you. And one more, and then we'll go to Councillor Sirikoff and back to Councillor Crawford. Are you good, Councillor Sirikoff? Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I just want to reiterate, re reiterate one of the questions brought up earlier as a follow-on. So do residents have any recourse or can appeal if they believe their, um, their, their property does not have any heritage, um, heritage overlay attributes, um, you know, in the coming weeks or months after, depending on, you know, the outcome of this motion tonight? Bronte. Um, thank you um, and, and thank the councillor for the question. So 
Um, the process that we are um, recommending tonight is um, was in fact started in uh, May, where for three weeks um, there was engagement with the community, and we amended uh, and, and and some 6,500 letters went out to the community. Uh, as a result of that. Uh, there have been a number of exclusions um, of properties um, from our initial list and I'd anticipate that um, as this process continues there will be further exclusions. What we're asking for tonight uh, is, a, is the recommendation is for uh, the commencement of the statutory process um, which will have as its next stage further engagement with all of the properties um, that are proposed to have their heritage um, status changed. All of those owners will again be contacted um, and um, the next stage of the process is a public independent review by an independent panel um, and all of those property owners will be able to attend that property and make a submission. That re that panel will then make a recommendation including um, any changes um, that the panel recommends. Those recommendations will then come back uh, to council for consideration um, and then if council proceeds in whatever form council takes um, that panel report plus the council uh, deliberations will then be taken to the Minister for Planning who will ultimately make the decision in this matter in terms of whether those properties are captured or not. Great. Thank you, Councillor Crawford, then Councillor uh, Consolo. So I just want to clarify, please. So if um, some properties became um, contributory tonight, uh, depending on the decision, it's not a, a stalling point. They can still talk to officers and apply and have those conversations about those, you know, um, conflicting or, you know, ch you know, bumping up against each other policies and try and work through solutions. So basically contributing is means that you just have to, as part of it, consider heritage as part of your process to upgrade whatever you're going to do to the house. So people can stu still do that work and talk to officers and, and hopefully find a resolution. Brian T. Uh, through you. Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, we've, the, the list continues uh, to evolve. Um, it is based on our heritage assessments, but we continue to find that sort of common sense approach in all of these. And then indeed, as I've explained, there's the independent process that will independently consider any um, heritage assessments. Do you want to go to Councillor Consolo? Or yeah, that'd be myself? great. Councillor Consolo. Thanks, everyone. Great questions. Uh, mine's a little bit following on Councillor Crawford, sir. So if the people are more ready to go on a, an application before their property might have been larger that didn't require a planning permit, but now um, if it passes tonight, they would fall into this interim heritage overlay. So they would almost, they could go ahead and apply as if they had a, a heritage overlay decided because that separate process has put it an interim status on it. But we could also, they could go through that application process with council and it could be ruled out or changed and they could um, still go forward. They don't have to wait to the last, to that decision's made. Is that correct? Brian T. Uh, yes, that is uh, correct. So we would still, um, uh, applications for development or indeed demolition can, can still be made. What council or officers will do is to consider the evidence or the heritage um, advice that we've got and work um, with that, but um, if again, if the if the if it's incorrectly um, considered to uh, as as having heritage significance, or we can accommodate a development uh, or a redevelopment or an addition that is consistent with that, we would certainly be uh, looking to achieve those outcomes. One more. Thank you. Line. Go ahead. I think it just left me. Um, Sorry, you have to come back to me. I... That's fine. Councillor Crawford. I know there's been some um, concerns um, expressed around particularly Mitford Street and, and why these houses have been included. Can we get a sense of why they, um, perhaps from yourself or Jessica, about why they have been considered to be included as contributory to that street? Thanks, Brian. Go ahead. Um, I, um, I might start just with, with some of them. We've, um, in, in one of the... Well, one of the ones which was 150 Barclay Street, which which we came up with, um, uh, having had a further 
uh, look at that and have a look at the um, uh, submissions that have been made. Um, it's our recommendation that that one will not be included as part of the heritage teach overlay. Uh, in terms of um, some of the others, I might um, um, I might ask if Jessica is available just to talk us through some of those others, otherwise I can have a go if we can't hear from her. Jessica, are you on the oh. line? Welcome. Yes, yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Um, so, so yes, with regards to the properties on um, in question at Midford and um, Street and Gordon Avenue, they have contributory gradings within the proposed precinct for the St Kilda Botanical Gardens and environs. So while most of the houses in Gordon Street are predominantly for the Federation era, in the broader precinct, it specifically identifies that houses from Victorian Federation interwar and post-war periods are of significance to the precinct. So these houses do fit in with the identified development errors of significance for this precinct. So that's why they've been graded as contributory because they're con considered to contribute to the heritage character of the precinct. Thank you, Councillor Consolo. Thank you, it came back to me. So timeline-wise, if people were to want to get on to the process, is there a little bit of an advantage to wait if you have to finish out? Um, okay, maybe, is there a process, a formal process that you're actually gonna do with deciding on the conflict between the heritage and the uh, SBO, the flooding overlay? Or is that information ready that if they, now, that they could be assessed so is there an advantage in waiting or is it ready to go? Thank you, Brian T. Um, thank you. In terms of the um, you know, competing policy outcomes um, from flooding and um, uh, the heritage, um, council officers have done some initial work. We do need to engage with Melbourne Water. Um, we will not wait until um, uh, the process is completed, as soon as we get sufficient um, uh, information and sufficient kind of guidance from that process, we will work with those properties that are affected. So we don't want to wait until the very end. We're not ready to start that discussion now, but as soon as we can, um, we will have those discussions. And if as part of that, as an interim part of the process, we need um, a decision from council in relation to a, a broader policy outcome or individual properties, um, we will do so because we understand that um, the statutory process is a lengthy process by its nature and, and partly because it, it, it allows for a, a high level of engagement. But if there's anything that we can do more quickly in order to provide certainty to homeowners, we will do that. Thank you. All right, councillors, any further questions? Councillors, you've got an officer's recommendation. Would one of you like to move this or something else? Councillor Copsey to move the officer's recommendation. No problem. I'm looking for a seconder, and yet seconded by Councillor Crawford. Councillor Copsey, can you please speak to the item? I will actually just reserve, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. I thought I had more time. Um, look, a thank you to everyone who um, reached out and identified um, concerns with us today um, and, and over the last week. Um, I get that this, anything to do with planning and houses, your homes, is a really difficult thing. I guess I will be supporting this tonight knowing that this still is a process for you to go ahead um, to work with officers um, with your plans in the meantime. It just means the heritage overlay has to be considered. It doesn't preclude certain outcomes. Um, and as you've heard tonight, that, that officers are willing to work to try and find those outcomes, particularly in those really low-lying areas of, of Elwood where perhaps demolition is the, is the only way to move forward to, to protect houses in the future. Um, one of the reasons that we are doing this is heritage changes over time. Uh, and the last time was 20 years ago uh, that they did this. And since then, there have been many buildings that have been lost because they didn't have heritage overlay. Buildings that were very valued by the community, um, homes that were valued by the community. And we, uh, on this last term, and I don't know if we've lost any this term, but last term we lost a couple of really big ones. Um, and so we got this process started. Uh, it's never perfect, 
and there, you know, there will be an opportunity to the panel to um, see if your property may get excluded if, if, if you have concerns around the validity of it, if it's heritage value. I'm not a heritage expert, so I need to go to that panel and, and hear what they said. I, I can't just exclude it. And once you start excluding one, it's how do you exclude, you know, where do you draw the line? But what reassures me is we are going to do this work because we are aware we're, we're a low-lying municipality and we need to figure out how to manage heritage and flooding and some of the other, you know, um, solar panels, which we already have managed, but in the future. And But we need to do the detailed, proper work. We can't just turn around now and, and pretend that it's easy to, to fix or, or that we, we, we would not be a considered thing to change tonight. Um, but we are going to do that work. However, I just want to reassure people, you can have offices. It doesn't preclude you going ahead and doing the building and having these concerns. The offices are there to work with you um, and, and try and find that, that mixing of the outcomes. Um, so, again, thank you for your contributions. I know this is difficult, um, but heritage is not... I guess it's that sense of heritage doesn't um, preclude everything. It's not. It's not... The work, it, it, in lots of ways, in many parts of our municipality, what a council decided to do 20 years ago has increased their property values through the roof. You know what I mean? Which is, and I know right now it's about you living in them, but there are, there are, have, and, and some of the outcomes that have come from these heritage areas keeps them more community minded. It's not, you don't get the big high rises, which a lot of, or the big builds, which like on Tennyson Street, there are so many apartments going in and people would love if they're, the house next to them was heritage listed, so a, 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 you know, extra apartments can't go in easily. So there's, it's, it's a really difficult um, situation. We have to make a hard decision like this. But this is part of the process. We're not at the final point. We're just taking it to an independent panel. There is still opportunity to work with our officers, um, and we are going to do the work around flooding and um, heritage and where they intersect. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Councillor Martin. Firstly, thank you so much to everyone who's made submissions. Thank you to those people who've emailed us, those people who've rung us. And I've done a bit of bike riding recently, going around and looking at some of the properties. I'm not, I can't pretend to be a heritage expert, um, but I can see where some of the concerns of some of the, pre the presenters tonight have come from. I don't believe that I know enough to be able to make those decisions myself. However, can I thank the councillor who've asked questions of Mr T and the other officers tonight, I think we've got a far better understanding now as councillors, and hopefully you have as, as members of our community as well, as to the various appeal processes that are open, and that if this motion gets through tonight, this is not the end of the line. In fact, it's a very early step in working out exactly what's going to end up being being covered under the next lot of um, under, under the next heritage overlay. And for those of you who. Um, are concerned that perhaps you, you believe that councillors' offices have been in error or councillors' advisors have made errors, you have ample opportunities to seek redress to that. And I'm sure if uh, you've got concerns, you can seek advice from your local councillors and council officers. And as Mr T says, they'll work very closely with you to endeavour to make sure that the correct decisions are being made. So I will be supporting the motion tonight, but I am very, very sympathetic to all those people who've presented tonight. And I hope, to, I hope that once these things go to higher authorities, that the correct decisions are made. Thanks. Councillor Martin. Deputy Mayor Baxter, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, I'll, I'll also be um, supporting this motion. I wanted to thank um, people who have uh, made submissions, people who have come to speak tonight, people who um, met with me and Councillor Crawford uh, earlier today. Um, I, I, given my experience in what it's like in practice when people are making um, planning applications to us and there's a heritage overlay on the property. I have found that our officers are really quite willing to work with people to find um, the best outcome there. I've never ever heard of a situation where someone who's in a flood uh, zone uh, and, and, you know, at, at real risk there and wants to, you know, um, uh, renovate their property uh, or, or change their property or even rebuild their property to mitigate that risk. I've, I've never heard of officers are saying a blanket no. There's always a discussion to be had and that's not to say that they accept every um, uh, application that comes forward but um, that discussion uh, is there. So a, a heritage overlay is not a, a death sentence and I understand that um, it can be uh, concerning. Um, there, there have also been some um, concerns, not just about those, those, those things like um, like flood overlays or, or, or solar panels. There have been some concerns from people who say, "Look, there actually isn't any heritage value in my property, and it shouldn't be listed." Um, 
I appreciate that 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 comment. Um, it's obviously a disagreement with our heritage advisor. I'm not a heritage expert. The best thing to do here to, would be to send that to the independent panel for them to basically determine um, that whether that property does have heritage value, uh, and and uh, you know that quite often in these in these um, planning scheme uh, amendments, uh, we send it to the independent panel and they come back with a number of changes saying this 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 is wrong or this doesn't work um, it is not a rubber stamp for whatever we send them uh, and, it, and I don't think anyone should should consider that that's the case so once it's gone to the independent panel they will come back with changes um, for sure and uh, we will we'll, we'll see what uh, they've disagreed with us on or what they think might be a better way to handle things uh, and of course um, <clears throat> we can, you know, uh, council and residents will have the opportunity to go through that process. Um, but even even after the uh, the actual planning scheme amendment process has, has completed and we've got um, the permanent heritage overlays uh, on houses, please rest assured that um, that does not mean you can't renovate. It doesn't mean you can't put solar panels on uh, and, and so on. There are always ways to, to get around these um, sorts of things to make sure that we can continue to value heritage while also making sure that people's practical concerns as homeowners um, are addressed uh, and that their needs are met as best as possible. It's often not perfect, but almost nothing is. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Councillor Bond. Um, yeah, just to reiterate a lot of the points that have already been made by my other councillors. Um, you know, having a heritage overlay on, on your property doesn't mean you, you can't renovate, doesn't mean you can't demolish. There are ways to do that, but it does um, provide a certain bar that needs to be met before that, that will occur. Um, and we, the reason we do these things is to, to cite a couple of cases that happened um, during the previous term of council where buildings we thought had heritage overlays on them and had heritage protection, namely the Greyhound Hotel on the corner of Carlisle and Brighton Road and the London Hotel um, down in Port Melbourne there, where I think everyone just looked at them and thought those buildings have heritage overlays, they're fine, um, until those buildings were demolished. And then there was great outrage from our community. Why hasn't council done its job? Why doesn't council have heritage protections in place? Um, how could you miss such glaring um, errors in your heritage scheme? And that's the reason we do review such as this, um, is to try and pick up um, heritage across our city that previous reviews have missed and, and ensure we have um, the sufficient, sufficient overlays in, in place so that when something comes along that we need to deal with, we can deal with that with, with the appropriate um, planning protections and considerations in place. Um, so that's, you know, and, and you can point to many examples across our city and, and the one I like to cite is a lot of South Melbourne, uh, Albert Park and, and Middle Park where heritage overlays were done in those areas, you know, 30, 35 years ago. It's now the most expensive property in Melbourne. So there isn't, doesn't necessarily go hand in hand that a heritage overlay destroys your property's value. The reason those properties are worth so much is because what you can do in those areas is so restricted. But there are still lots of examples right throughout that area even though it does have a high degree of heritage protection where people have been able to modify their homes have been able to to knock down and rebuild so it doesn't prevent it entirely um, but it does ensure that there is a good degree of protection not just for um, the, the existing residents but also for future residents who, who come along in these areas so you know, we hear your concerns that those that are immediately affected by by this but there is another step to this where you can you know, as, as a number of councillors said, we're not heritage experts, but you can appeal um, or, or state your case to a group of people who are more planning experts than we are, and they will come back if, they, if, if your case is, um, has merit. They will come back to us and say, no, you've got it wrong, or here's suggested changes to, to your planning scheme that we recommend as a result of our review of, of your council's work. And, and that is quite common. Um, so you know, this isn't the end of the line here here tonight. Um, if, if you're, you know, the cases you've put forward tonight do have merit, there's another group with a lot more experience than us who will be able to review them and give a, a more educated um, opinion than, than we're able to give here tonight on, on the heritage value or otherwise of, of your property. So I will be supporting this um, because I understand the greater good of our community. This is highly important that we do this heritage work because if we don't do it, um, 
you know, our city just wouldn't be the way it is today if, if heritage work hadn't been done by councils 30, 30, 25 years ago. And we're just continuing on that process here as councillors and, and these, these reviews will happen um, for the next, I don't know how many years, the next future councils from us will continue to do this work hopefully um, and ensure that our city largely remains the great city um, that it is today. Thanks Councillor Bond. Who else would like to speak to the item? Councillor Consola, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I too have a strong respect for heritage as you know many do. Uh, even in the audience, and even with my architecture background, I don't, I wouldn't consider myself an expert. So we have to rely on the Heritage Advisor's advice here. I'm very sorry to hear of the stress, the heartache, the time and effort that this is affecting you. And definitely it's raised a lot of questions and concerns when something like this comes about. You, it's fearful what the change will mean in I think it's important to note that tonight's meeting has been recorded. There's been a lot of questions asked and answered. That's a great resource. So when you call up your architects and your building designers, you can reference this meeting for some information to move forward. The statutory process takes a lot of time from design concept through to actually constructing a building. So to get started now, knowing your options, and you, I'm pleased to hear that you will be able to look at renovation and redevelopment while this process is going on, I bet I, I understand there's a lot more hoops. So please have some reassurance that there is still, what you're dreaming for your home can still possibly be achieved. It's just now come to council, have a chat about it. So thanks for coming here tonight and talking to us because it's really important to hear how you're individually affected in the properties. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Consolo. Councillor Sirikoff, did you want to speak? No, I wasn't going to, but I'll just make the one Oops. one comment. I know contradictory there, but since you invited me, Mayor, um, thank you. Uh, I'm sort of uh, reassured by what one of the council officers just said a moment, a few minutes ago, and that is that if you do have some recourse or you want to appeal um, whatever decision's been made on your property due to a due to this heritage overlay. Um, that you, you can take that course and there's still a number of processes still to go so that you can you can take those on and um, and get the outcome that hopefully get the outcome that you, that you want so this is not the the um, final stop of um, um, what might affect your property thank you councillors I'll now hand to councillor Copsey to close no, don't wish to close. Okay, councillors, I'll put that motion. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Okay, great. Let's now move to item 10.9, which is pop-up bike lanes. Uh, councillors, your questions of the officers in relation to this report, please. There being none, I seek a mover. Oh, sorry, pardon me, I missed one. You can ask a question, go for it. Um, yeah, we'll go through the questions first, if we, can, if we may, though. That's one that just depends on what's being moved, that's all. So, asking for a mover of this or something else, Councillor Bond, do you wish to move the officer's recommendation? Uh, no, I wish to move an alternate recommendation. Could you put that uh, alternate on the screen, please? Um, I think it's up there. It's a little bit small on the screen in front of me, but just I'll... Just detail the changes if I'll, you could. I'll try. Um, point 3.2, deletion, highlighting that a conflict point between cyclists and vehicles will be reintroduced. 3.3, deleting, highlighting the reintroduction of safety risks for cyclists. 3.4, deletion of noting this may require the removal of on-street parking and replace with and requests that any concept requiring the removal of on-street parking spaces be brought to councillors immediately and for community consultation to be undertaken prior to any implementation. 3.5, deletion of noting this may require the removal of on-street parking spaces and the inclusion of and requests that any concept requiring the removal of on-street parking spaces 
be brought to councillors immediately and for community consultation to be undertaken prior to any implementation. 3.6, the inclusion of option two. Council supports the reinstatement of the dedicated left turn from Bridge Street into Bay Street in Port Melbourne and investigates other options to improve safety for bike riders in this location. 3.7, re Council requests that Department of Transport reviews the treatments of other dedicated left turn lanes from minor roads in Port Phillip during the implementation of the rollout of the recent DOT pop-up bike lanes, such as the ones in Dickens Street at Brighton Road in Elwood, Mitchell Street at Carlisle Street in St Kilda, and Blessington Way at Carlisle Street in St Kilda, and where these and other left turn lanes removals have resulted in a loss of amenity to pedestrians, cyclists and motorists, seek agreement from City of Port Phillip for the removal of these treatments and reinstatement back to the original conditions. That's right. And just whilst we're on that page, we'll get option one removed as well. Councillor Bond, if right. that's okay. Um, and then... And Dickens Street has an error. ENS. Um, 3.7 becomes 3.8 all the way down to the new 3.14. All those things move down one dot point. 3.14 now reads, supports the da Department of Transport proposal to continue to engage the community and deletes and the DIT, DOT proposal that all communication be co-branded. Then 3.15... 15.1, 15.2 and 16 all get, all get new numbers. Thank you, Councillor Bond. That was very comprehensive, so, so many changes. I'm seeking a second of the Councillor Bond's motion. Councillor Clark, thank you. Councillor Bond, speak to your motion, please. Um, most of this is the original Councillor's office, Officer's recommendation with, with a couple of changes. Um, I think, yeah, if I start from the top, the... Um, you know, there's a little bit of commentary there about whether or not this does or doesn't create um, additional conflict for cyclists in at least one of those instances. I don't believe that's the case. I think it you know, may or may not be the case in the, in the first one, but definitely not the case in the second one. So I think those, that commentary should be removed from the motion. Um, there's a, I don't want the community to interpret 3.4 and 3.5 is that council are supporting the removal of car parks in these particular locations. So uh, making it clear that if, if any proposal was to come back to us with the removal of car parks um, or any proposal that has a re removal of car parks in it doesn't just get implemented, it comes to councillors for councillors to have a discussion and commentary on that and that it goes to the community, more importantly, so that they are able to understand what is about to take happen out the front of their houses and there are no surprises in this area and the community has an opportunity to provide us with feedback in those particular streets and that applies to Bridge Street and Westbury Street in, in St Kilda. Um, I know it's been, I've been inundated with people saying what about my street, what about my street, what about my corner, there are numerous other spots in our city that we, um, we could also like to be reviewed um, and in the opinion of many they are, they are equally as bad as the ones we have got agreement to reverse. Um, but we've put in there, that I think there's one that's obvious one is all the blocking of the left-hand turn lanes from minor streets um, in our city, such as Dickens and Brighton Road, uh, Mitchell Street and Carlisle, Blessington Way and Carlisle, and there are, there are numerous other examples where I think we need to review them immediately because all they do is hold up traffic. They've done nothing to improve cyclist safety. They've done nothing to help pedestrians. Um, all they've done is frustrate motorists and slow them down and get people stuck. And in fact... I had an incident this morning where, uh, coming out of uh, Blessington Way, um, because the cars have been waiting there so long, um, numerous cars just came out and blocked the road because they wanted their chance to get across because, because we'd blocked the left-hand turn lane. They took a dangerous action to try and get out and, and took advantage of a really small gap that they forced their way through and, and did a left-hand turn. So, you know, it's encouraged that sort of behaviour which, which just wasn't there there previously, um, and then the last change here is the um, the removal of our our branding from the documentation. This is a DOT project, so I don't believe our branding should be on there. Um, speaking generally about bike lanes in our city, I think it's very pleasing that the state government has listened to us. It's very pleasing that DOT has has listened to us, and they have made some immediately changes. So I think we should thank them greatly for listening, and thank them 
and be encouraged that they are listening to us. Obviously, the, 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 you know, there's a lot of strong feedback from the community that they would like much more changes to occur here. And I know this motion, once again, isn't addressing everything they want, um, but this is probably a next little thing for us to have a look at. If we can get these um, changes implemented and have a few other areas looked at, that's probably the next step here. And then we can continue to work with our community on any other elements that, that cause concern to them, and we will feed that um, information back to the Department of Transport and request that they review any other elements that are not currently mentioned here. And I know there are many across the municipality. So yeah, I'd just like to say you know, thank you to DOT, thank you to State Government for actually listening. Um, you know, it would be very easy just to dig your heels in and tell people to suck it up, but they haven't done that. They've, they've, they are working with us, they are listening, um, and they are prepared to make changes to this program in response to the, to the feedback we're receiving from our residents. So I, I commend you. this motion to our councillors and um, it would be great if, if you know, they were all able to support this. Thank you. Council Councillor Clark, thank you. Thanks, Mayor. And um, I concur with, obviously, what Councillor Bond has said and would like to recognise the changes that have been made and the statements from the Department of Transport to roll some of this back. But uh, there is a lot more work to be done um, to, in terms of rectifying this program. Uh, the three kilometres out of the 38 uh, that's been looked at uh, doesn't go near far enough to respond to the community feedback that we've received regarding this program. Um, some of the most critical ones have been addressed in the recent uh, announcements and changes, but particularly along Marine Parade, uh, where you've got the concrete blocks to turn left into the streets uh, along Elwood and St Kilda, uh, creates car problems now with uh, the difficulty of turning left and the Glen Huntley and Dickens ones have been addressed but we need to look at the rest of those streets along there. Um, Dickens turning from Dickens into Brighton uh, and now unable to kind of go left into that, into the merging into the traffic easily. There's all sorts of examples like that uh, littered around Canal Ward uh, and obviously the rest of the municipality. Um, many of the changes have been made in the other wards of our city and I think there's still a lot to be looked at uh, in the Canal Ward part of the municipality, particularly Westbury Street, which I'm pleased to see is mentioned specifically here. Uh, the community has uh, strongly opposed the changes. They had a, a normal street uh, with plenty of room for their cars and bikes um, and they've ended up with... Um, a pop-up bike lane that uh, doesn't really work for the street is very confusing uh, and it's distressing to see that the potential solution is to remove their car spaces. So um, it's a, at the moment uh, very unsatisfactory for Westbury Street residents and so I think uh, it's good the engagement that we're now getting, being able to pass on that feedback is important uh, through our council officers and I thank Brian for being a, probably a big filter and mailbox for that. Um, but yeah, as I said, this this is the next part, you know, stage two of uh, looking into the rollback and there's many, many other streets, as Councillor Bond said, that hopefully will be captured in the full review um, that will be coming back to us shortly. So I fully support this motion. Thanks, Councillor Crawford. Who else would like to speak to the item? Councillor Crawford. Did I say Councillor Crawford? Thanks, Councillor Crawford, rather than Councillor I just said who would like to speak. It's all right, we'll carry on. Uh, sorry, I have no idea what's going on. Who else wants to speak? Thank you, Councillor Martin, go ahead. Um, as many of you know, I'm probably the most avid bike rider of all of the people in this room. I reckon I do about 100 k's a week. I've had a couple of very unfortunate experiences on bikes in the city of Port Phillip, and I'll talk about left turn lanes in just a moment. I nearly got killed in Brighton Road when a van turned in front of me and put me into Argyle Street, so I'm, you're either lucky or unlucky to still have me here, and I'm still getting, I'm, ha ha ha, and I'm still having cortisone injections in my shoulder when I got T-boned on the corner of Shakespeare Grove and Ackland Street last year, so I've got a, a, a few concerns about bike safety. What really disappoints me about the quality of the debate, the comments of the forums that, we, that I was at last night, is so many of the comments are about what things look like. So many comments are about visual amenity and very few people are talking about cyclist safety. And 
having both driven and pedalled on virtually every one of the 38 k's of bike paths that have been implemented here in Port Phillip, I'm very comfortable that 85% of them are very, very fit for purpose. When I'm driving my car, I feel much more aware of where cyclists are because of the markings that are on the road. When I'm on my bike, on 85% of these bike paths, I feel much safer because I feel that the motorists are aware of where I am and I feel that I'm comfortable. I'm going to take issue with... Um, what was it? Councillor Clark's comments on the left turn lanes. And can I be quite specific about left turn lanes? In the, the Marine Parade left turn lanes have slowed down traffic when traffic is turning left and having ridden there many times, often before the new bike lanes were put into Marine Parade, the um, separated bike lanes that lead up for about 80 metres coming up to Dickens Street and about 150 metres leading up to Glen Huntley Road, cars would drift in at the very last moment and suddenly turn left right in front of me as a cyclist and I found that quite unsafe. The reverse though is true on corners like the corner of Bridge Street and Bay Street and Bridge Street and Williamstown Road where there is only a single lane and, and I'm, I'm sure the Department of Transport acted with the best of intentions. Um, they've removed a number of the slip lanes and as a result traffic has banked up significantly and motorists have been behaving in very poor ways in inching out onto roads and that's actually putting cyclists at risk, particularly those cyclists who are coming down the major road. So a cyclist coming down Williamstown Road towards Murphy Reserve all of a sudden finds cars inching out to turn right because there's 15 cars flashing lights in behind them. So um, yes, the Department of Transport didn't get it all right. It got 85% of it right. Um, but I suppose the, the, the only things that... Uh, I mean, I'm in a quandary here because I can support 99% of what's written here. The thing, that, the, the thing that upsets me most is in 3.9, Councillor Bond, where we're talking about visual amenity. If we were talking about safety, and I know that a number of people in Gateway would have approached me about 3.9, and the, the words in this motion support the concerns that a number of ratepayers and residents have come to me with, but that's the one thing that I'm concerned about. All the others here, I think, are quite significant improvements However, I don't agree with Councillor Bond and Councillor Clark that we need to do any more. I think with what's in this motion, we've more than covered all the major issues of cyclist, motorist, pedestrian safety. And if there are minor issues that turn up further down the track, the Department of Transport have guaranteed that they'll come back to us and address them immediately, and I'm quite happy to accept that. I certainly wouldn't want to see any further major gutting of our bike lanes. I'm going to sit on the fence and decide how I'm going to vote for this in a minute because nearly everything here Nearly all the concerns that I've had about cyclist safety or motorist behaviour are addressed in the various amendments here. Um, I'm sitting on the fence about the visual amenity and uh, yeah, that's the one part of this motion I'm uncomfortable with. Thanks, Councillor Martin. Apologies for the mix-up in the names. I now understood what I did before, Councillor Clark and Councillor Crawford. Uh, Deputy Mayor Baxter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, I, I won't be supporting this, uh, this alternative uh, uh, motion by the... the um, to Liberal Party councillors, I will instead foreshadow that I'll move the uh, officer's recommendation in case this fails. Um, the main issues that I uh, have is that well, I, it really goes... It's, it's, point it's, point it's, of order. Go ahead. 49.3 Part E, an error of fact. I'm not a Liberal Party councillor, and neither is Councillor Clark. So if you could ask Councillor Baxter to withdraw that comment. You can withdraw or clarify... I'm extremely confused. I was of the I was of the understanding that both of these councillors are councillors and members of the Liberal Party. That's the clarification that's required. But I think there's a uh, a slight difference in terms of they may be members of a political party, but they're not endorsed by that political party. But you've made the clarification. I, did, I appreciate. I, I it. didn't call them endorsed Liberal Party councillors. No, that's fine. You've made yep. the clarification. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, uh, let's continue. Fancy being a friend uh, of overall being point of order. <laughs> Your own political party. Um, so the, the the issues that I, that I have really go right through all of the the changes that Councillor Bond has made here. So some of them are that not only do we want to remove or, or, or change a treatment, but we want to actually um, wipe out any mention that this might make it a little bit more unsafe to remove that treatment. Um, I don't believe in, in, in squashing uh, those uh, opinions. That is clearly uh, the, the opinions of experts um, that if you remove one of these treatments, um, there will be conflict points that are returned and there will be uh, a, a certain amount of safety issue that um, comes from that. Uh, so 
Hang on. Uh, the, the, the motion that was put up is different to the motion that was um, circulated to us, so I'm just going to have to try and um, uh, guess. Uh, no, that's all right. I'll, I'll sort of come to it. Um, the, 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 the parts that, that um, talk specifically about um, attempting to rule out any removal of on-street parking or attempting to put a number of um, uh, uh, gates uh, in front of that. Um, basically, if we want to redesign a space because perhaps it's not working in the way that it was originally designed, it's the, the, the officer's recommendation was simply saying they may have to look at all of the space. Right, And if we can actually get, for example, in Bridge Street, this is just off the top of my head, a, a workable, safe, um, protected uh, cycle lane that, that works for cyclists, pedestrians and motorists and you only had to lose two parking spaces to do, that should be considered. And that, I, I, this, this, this idea that that is... Uh, you know, something that should have its own special thing that's separate from the normal discussions that we would have with DOT seems uh, strange to me. We will have those discussions with DOT no matter what. We've asked them to, to, to look at those again. Um, the recommendation that the, that the uh, communications no longer be co-branded is, is petty. It's, this is a partnership with... Um, that DOT, they've shown re incredibly good faith by, as Councillor Bond notes, um, responding to our motion, um, providing us a letter and, and taking action on a number of different things for us to then say, and by the way, we don't want our logo on your, <laughs> on your communications anymore, I think is, is extraordinarily petty. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to look at what other parts here are different to... Uh, what's been uh, the left turn lane stuff. So th this apparently seems to have been a last minute inclusion by Councillor Bond um, to uh, take, take the next step uh, in, the, in the crusade against um, safe bike infrastructure. So um, the, can we go to, the, um, to the, uh, the, the part about the left turn lanes? I think it's 3.7. Oh. There we go. Yeah. So again, this was not um, this was not circulated to councillors um, beforehand. This is extremely last minute. So um, uh, these uh, these here have not um, featured um, heavily or, or at all in the feedback that DOT has um, received. In fact, Canal Ward has actually been extraordinarily quiet in terms of. Um, uh, negative responses from uh, the community, with the exception of uh, the Westbury Street treatment, which of course um, needs needs work and needs uh, a better solution. But um, these ones uh, that that we're talking about here almost have not been mentioned at all by many people in the community. Um, and although some people may have issues with them, Councillor Martin has explained why uh, some of these uh, are, are extremely important. And what I would say is that uh, the wording there that says where it's resulted in a loss of amenity to pedestrians, cyclists and motorists, it doesn't use the word safety, it simply talks about amenity. Um, that's completely unacceptable uh, as, a, as a criteria for us to judge the, um, whether or not we should be retaining uh, these, uh, these um, uh, the, the dedicated left turn lanes. So those are a number of reasons why I cannot support this alternative um, motion and I will be, in the case that this fails, uh, moving the original officer's recommendation. And we'll take that as a foreshadowed count Councillor Baxter, if that's okay. Um, who else would you speak to? Oh, Councillor Crawford, thank you. Oh, I know it's a long night. I'll try and keep it sweet. I think we've all forgotten what the whole point of this program is, and it's kind of disappointing. We are trying to make it safer for cyclists on our roads, full stop. Does that mean we have to change our behaviour? Yes, it does, like anything to keep people safe or to make things better for people. Is it uncomfortable? Yes. Um, and it's, So it is about changing driver behaviour. I'm not saying everything's right, but this has gone to an extreme. Like, as I said... Canal Ward has hardly had any feedback and suddenly all these things are appearing in here and I live on one of the bike paths so I'm witnessing it every day and 
people have to slow down. There has been a change in behaviour. The whole point is for us to make it safer. Now, I, we haven't done the CEO report first, but there's a startling um, statistic in there. So, um, and I haven't got the clarification from Joe, but there's 44,000 uh, trips of cyclists, I believe, in, in July of last year. We have jumped this year to 104,000 trips. We have a responsibility to keep cyclists on our roads safe, the current ones, but also for people like me who never drive, who never cycle anywhere because I don't feel brave enough. And in cities, smart cities around the world are ripping out their cars, they're replanting, they're doing separate bike lanes because the only way we can reduce traffic, reduce parking congestion is to give people a safe alternative of how to move around our city. And all the stats go as we grow and densify, which we are going to do, we are going to end up gridlocked and parking. The idea is to encourage people to only have one car or to cycle safely or walk or catch public transport. That's how dense cities around the world do it. And so what this whole trial was to trial for a long period of time, these things that may be ugly. And then if they have approved to make it safer for cyclists, then you could look at how you could design the permanent infrastructure that may be more visually appealing or may remove a couple of car, uh, car spaces. I just... I'm really, really, really disappointed, OK? I understand that maybe there's some of the streets aren't there, but some of these left-turn lanes, the whole point is to separate cyclists. It's to get drivers on roads, all of them, used to make, looking for cyclists. Um, so uh, the idea, it's kind of like what we used to say about Councillor Brand, um, uh, forgive me, David, we're designing by council, you know, design a house by council. We, we, um, we have to give these a fair go. And I understand there's a couple of things that may need to be changed, but I, I don't know if I can vote. I was going to vote by bits by bit, but I may not be able to do the whole thing. The other thing about Westbury is the only reason Westbury and Bridge are kind of designed like that is because they were trying not to take out any car spaces. So if we could take out car spaces, they may have been redesigned differently, you know, that allowed for that more side riding, you know... And so I just think when we lost when we lost some um, parking spots to pop up parklets during COVID, it has made our city better. It's a similar thing. It's uncomfortable. It's difficult. Uh, they're not easy decisions to make. Yes, it requires adjustment. But we have a responsibility, a key responsibility, to keep our community safe. And that looks like many different things. And we are failing miserably for our cyclists at the moment. So I don't even know what bits I'm going to be able to support because I'm actually really disappointed. We're not ever talking about safety. It's... Yeah, so they're not... And, and for experienced riders, you may not like it, but for riders like me, I'm never going to get on a bike. How are we going to get people out of cars? How are we going to reduce the need, the congestion on parking if we don't provide this kind of infrastructure? And it's really difficult to put it back into... retrofit it into inner city. I get that. But we're not even giving it a proper chance, and that's the bit I'm most upset about, is I understand some of them, but this is going to a whole point where we're not even giving it a chance. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Who else would like to speak? All right, Councillor Bond, do you wish to close? No, Councillor Sirikoff, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Pleasure. Um, well, I, I am supportive of um, this uh, alternative motion um, on the ground on several for several reasons, and that is back in September of last year um, when this motion was brought to us, there was a lack of um, design that was that was in front of us to vote on. And um, as a result of that, we ended up uh, on the 20th of July of this year, a gallery, a full gallery of people who were objecting to the poor design, uh, the confusing and unsafe um, uh, uh, bike lanes that had been installed with the, um, with the concrete blocks, the um, bollards, uh, sections protruding out into the middle of the road, halving the size of the the tra road that you could travel on, making um, bicycles and cars that could easily travel side by side, approaching a, an intersection, now being merged into uh, one lane. And who gives way to who? Um, so um, so I, I, I'm, I'm glad we've got this opportunity to make it better for everybody because the designs from that gallery of people um, objecting to the way they had been designed and considering it unsafe, they wanted to, they wanted a change. They wanted the unsafe uh, intersections to be removed, those corners where it's hard to turn left when you're on a 60 kilometre road on Beaconsfield Parade um, with cars coming up the rear of you and you're having to slow down um, and making a, 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 
a 90 degree left hand turn. This, this is not a safe way to do things. And um, also on the aspect of back in uh, when we when this was voted on back in September of last year, there was no mention in that design of all the pop-up bike lanes across the 38 kilometres of any removal of uh, car spaces. And I think it's really appropriate with this amendment that we we do when um, the um, traffic engineer people come back to us from DOT that they give us an opportunity to look at those designs and to give the um, community an opportunity to give feedback. We had a gentleman here tonight from Westbury Street um, giving us his numbers and I have no reason to doubt him. He seemed quite sensible about the whole thing. Um, the, the, impact on the, the impact and pressure on this, those streets there if they were to lose any more parking spaces. We have to listen to our residents and Councillor Crawford said at the last... Um, council meeting. We need to listen to our residents. We had a whole gallery of people who turned up on the twentieth. Uh, turned up on the twentieth of July, a full gallery of people with posters showing how dangerous our intersections are. They want bike lanes. They want them. They. I've had so many emails saying people want bike lanes, and this information came from both residents and cyclists, cyclists who also drive cars. And they're saying that these were unsafe roads and they wanted a better outcome for everybody. We all want a better outcome. It has to be a win-win for everybody. But when you've got a whole gallery of people turning up and they want, they want better designs, we have to listen to them. And so on those, on that, for those reasons, I'm, I'm supportive of this motion so we get it right for everybody. Not for the short term, for, but for the long term. And we've got to be listening to our residents. Um, oh. Yeah, so I think it's appropriate that we have the opportunity that when DOT do redesigns, and notably Westbury Street and Bridge Street, um, that we have the opportunity to go back to the community and see, does, say, does this suit you? Because that's what consult consultation is all about. And that consultation in the first place, back in, back in September, and um, no, March, when all the postcards went out, that didn't include removal of car spaces. And we've got that opportunity now to have that engagement with, with the community. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Sirikoff. Councillor Consola, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you to DOT for responding and listening to the community and the councillor's motion, particularly in the Gateway Ward, with this first round of review. Some of it was more than I expected, actually. I generally have ridden less in the past few months due to the colder weather, but in particular, I have avoided Bridge Street, as many have. Uh, I do support most of this amendment, but I'll go through it. The pop-up bike lanes on or the review of Bridge Street in particular, I'm not really sure where car spaces would be lost because there's, it was a really su previously successful bike lane and there's only about three to four cars that exist, spaces that exist within the centre bike lane area and they seem to be fine. So that one, um, I'm happy for it to hear what they have to say, but I'm actually surprised that the discussion of car loss there has even been had. I hear the Westbury residents and it's, and I'm hoping that the, that DOT come back very soon with the options of revisions that we can look at. It's, I'm intrigued to hear what they think they could achieve if they did lose some car spaces. That's not necessarily the way I'll support. It's just I'd like to hear the options. And that's why I'm suggesting come back with concepts early before you go down too far of design because we want to just understand what, what the options there would be. And... Now, there's an, a dedicated email address for the Department of Transport that feel, I feel it's the most successful way that they're hearing the information. And I encourage people, as this continues to be a program, to use that email address. It seems to be reaching the right people. Use the email address. If you need it, we can find it for you. And I'm delighted by 3.9 that they're going to remove the speed hump outside the Child Care Center. So again, Gateway Ward, doing well up here. I'm not sure about 3.7, and it's a little bit late. I'm really tired to consider something so last minute, but I see it as a request, 
and it'll come back to us for further discussion, just like all of us has come back, and we're having the opportunity to say yes or no to it. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to support it tonight, but I, I don't know how I feel about it in general. I do want to make writing, I don't want to make writing reduce. This is what I'm worried that some of the things that have been happening are making more people go, oh, I'm not going to necessarily ride. Not the opposite, where we're trying to get more cyclists on the road. So this proper program is still going, and I appreciate the continuous review, because the goal is to get more people riding their bikes. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Consolo and um, Councillor Copsey. Go ahead. Can I please test an amendment? It's a fairly minor amendment, but Go I don't it. know if councillors will be um, That's right. open what, to it. What do you wish to do? The amendment would be to, in 3.7, delete amenity and replace it with safety. So, yeah, that's, that's we're within order. And Councillor Martin's indicated you wish to second that. Um, you wish to speak to your... Unless it's a minor amendment that the... And the second right, We don't need a vote. Yeah, okay, done. That now forms part of the, well, sorry, part of the substantial. So thank you for doing that. That's okay. I just saved Were you 10 about to speak that. to this, Mayor? Uh, you, you're allowed to speak, go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, I'm pleased to see that change, but I will not be supporting this overall. Um, I didn't, I, I wasn't uh, part of the supportive of the council decision um, the other week when we started cherry picking elements of the bike lane program to roll back. Uh, and so I don't think it would be appropriate for me to support this tonight. There are some things in it that I feel more strongly about than others, but um, in total I regard it as probably a reduction in safety um, that some of the moderate improvements that have been rolled out through this program delivered, and I can't support that. I have heard lots of mixed feedback on this program and we've kind of already had this debate at the previous meeting, so I won't repeat myself too strongly. But for example, the Bridge Road, the Bridge Street um, lanes, which I know have been divisive, I've also heard positive feedback about. I said last time we discussed this that my preferred um, approach to all of this was to allow the trial to proceed as was originally proposed, which is, these are temporary pop-up lanes that are tested through experience. DOT um, has, throughout the entire process, been open to and receptive to feedback. Um, and I have confidence will continue to be throughout the process. I think that with many of these, the experience is vastly different. If you're a writer, I too have noticed what um, Councillor Martin was speaking about, where uh, when being a passenger in a car, occasionally I've heard someone say, oh, this, this curb, I have to go around this curb now. And I said, yes, you have to slow down. I wasn't driving. Um, but I've experienced that as a rider going through those intersections where um, the cars do slow down and they don't tend to drift into the bike lane the way that they used to. And so, yes, that might be annoying or uh, require a change of practice for drivers, but it is having an effect of reducing speed um, when they're turning into those intersections. So I think that 3.7 is actually um, real overreach this evening and I'll be disappointed if that um, should go through. So perhaps we can take it in parts. Um, the, the main thing that I've been hearing as a constant refrain whenever it comes to bike um, and pedestrian safety in this city is that we need to improve separation. Uh, over and over I've heard that people, some in the community would have loved to see this trial include more separation um, between users. And I think that that's where we need to be focusing our efforts into the future. Um, so I'm, I'm disappointed to see further safety erosion um, through this motion tonight. And I guess the only thing that I will note is just deleting those observations around um, the conflict points that are going to be reintroduced as a result of the rollback uh, doesn't make the situation go away. Um, it looks a bit sneaky to me. So we'll push on. I encourage people, as I have through this entire process, to continue to provide your feedback. The part that I would have liked to vote for uh, would be to um, 
support the department's proposal to continue engaging the community uh, and also to thank them for their collaborative approach to this program, which we know we have seen when it's rolled out in other municipalities across the state has led to massive uptake uh, and increase in ridership, which is what we are looking to do, boost, something was sorely needed in our city. I hear the concerns around congestion and parking, and I've got and I say if we are going to address those um, issues long term, we need to encourage mode shift, we need to encourage shared transport, we need to make our city more walkable, and we need to make our city more rideable for everyone in our community, not just existing confident cyclists. And we know that separation uh, is what helps women and other vulnerable road users, elderly people, children who might be riding to school to feel safe on our roads, and that's what I'll continue to stand up for. Thank you, Councillor Copsey. Um, is that a formal uh, request to separate 3.7 in a separate vote? Have a think about it. If you want to do it, let me know. Councillor Bond, do you wish to close? Um, yeah, just to address a couple of the points that were made, I'd like to thank Councillor Copsey for her amendment to the motion. Um, safety and amenity are often used interchangeably, but safety is probably a much more appropriate word to use in 3.7 than, than amenity. Uh, this motion in no way says that no car parking is going to be removed, but what it does say is in the event that the Department of Transport uh, proposes to remove car parking in either Bridge Street or Westbury Street, that councillors are told about it straight away so that we are aware of it prior to happening. But much more importantly, our community is told about it and that our community is aware of it um, before it happens and they have an opportunity to provide us with feedback, which is something I think didn't happen um, with, the, with the current proposals. They were rolled out pretty much without anyone knowing what was going to occur in the streets out the front. So I think it's important we include our, our community in this. Um, I, I've been receiving lots of feedback from Canal Ward just today. I've had four emails and texts from them. so. It is a big issue in Canal Ward, and I won't speculate on why they choose to send their feedback to me and not Councillor Baxter, um, because that'd be wrong. So that's all I've got to say um, about this motion. Thank you. And um, I've had a request from Councillor Baxter to vote on 3.11, 3.12, which is now 3.12, 3.13. Do you want to do 3.7 separately? OK, what I'll do, just to not confuse things, so... Uh, I think the easiest way to do this is I'll put three points. Um, so we're voting under Rule 33 to separate it. So you don't get the opportunity to speak more. Obviously, we're just vote separating the votes. So the first vote I'm going to take is, if we bring it up on the screen, 3.12 and 3.13, which is the new versions of what you requested before, Councillor Baxter. So we're just voting on, on these two items now, Councillors. So 3.12 and 3.13. Those in favour... Those against? No, 3.12. Sorry, 3.12 and 3.13. Yeah. Oh, my apologies. So we're voting on 3.12 and 3.13, which is 3.12 and... 3.13, which was previously 3.11 and 3.12, which is what you asked to vote for separately on before. I did it? Okay, no troubles. Yeah, just so I'm clear, so everyone's clear, I'm going to do three votes. The first vote is on point 12 and point 13, then I'm going to vote on point 7, and I'm going to vote on everything else. Anyway, I'm putting to the vote Point 12 and point 13, those in favour? Those against? That's carried. I'm now putting to the vote three... I was... 3.1 is not on the screen. 3.12... I was... All right, I'll, I'll dissolve the previous vote which I'm allowed to do, and I'll resubmit the vote. Are you clear on what we're voting for? We're clear on 3.12 and 3.13 only. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. I now move to three... What's ridiculous? Are we clear? Okay. Three... Uh, I'll take these in the order I'm doing them. So 3.7... If you can put that on the screen, please. 
All right. Now we're only voting on item 3.7. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Can we have a division? Division requested on 3.7. Those in favour? Councillor Bond, Councillor um, Sirikoff, Councillor Consolo, Councillor Pearl, Councillor Martin and Councillor Clark in favour. Those against? Councillor Deputy Mayor Baxter, Councillor Crawford and Councillor Copsey. The uh, 3.7 is carried. 3.9 has been requested on, uh, to be voted on separately by Councillor Martin. Please put 3.9 on the screen. Is that what you're requesting? 3.10, rather, has been requested to vote separately by Councillor Martin. 3.10. Okay, I'm now putting that motion, that part. Uh, those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Councillor Martin, did you wish another section to be voted on separately? Okay. If we go to 3.11, that's what you wish? Okay, 3.11, I'll allow, it wouldn't usually be as generous as this, but let's just do it because we've given so much grace tonight. 3.11, we're voting on now. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Okay, now we're voting on all remaining sections under report number 10.9. All remaining sections. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. And the overall motion is carried. Thank you, councillors. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for giving me some grace as we went through that voting structure. Let's now move to item 10.6, which is the St Kilda Triangle Next Steps. Councillors, questions of officers. It's fine, take your time. Do you want one now? I was going to do this item and then we'll have a five minute break if that's okay. Uh, there's a few more to get through. We're, we're, we're not too far away. And then we've got notices of motions after that. Uh, unless we wish to move them to next time. But let's get going. 10.6, Council's questions of the officers on the St Kilda Triangle report. There being none, I'm looking for a mover to this motion or something else. Councillor Bond, thank you. Do you wish to move the officer's recommendation? Um, I wish to move the officer's recommendation with one slight amendment, option What's... two, with the additions of the word um, after initial community engagement, ad additions of the word in addition, consider just, just the opportunity for both. Two seconds, both... Councillor Bond, if you could. 10.6 is the report, that's it. It's basically Councillor Crawford's old recommendation. <laughs> which I'm happy to include. So next one down, option two. Yeah, that one, with Councillor Crawford's suggested change. Would you like Councillor Bond to read that out, officers? No problem. Okay. All right. Is there a seconder to this? Is there a seconder? Uh, Councillor Sirikoff, thank you. Councillor Bond, please speak to your item. Do I need to read the additional? Oh, yes. Sorry, pardon me. Thank you for reminding me. All right. Um, option two is the original officer's recommendation for option two, original office wording, um, with the addition of the words, in addition, consider the opportunity for both long-term and temporary outcomes for the site. Great, thank you. And Councillor Sirikov, thank you for um, seconding the motion. Councillor Bond, go ahead. Um, look, I think this is a way to progress this site. I know there is 
um, we've heard tonight, some people come along and said, hey, this a live music venue uh, performance space, function space on this site would be a, a great, out great outcome. Um, there were a couple of music industry people here tonight who spoke um, about how this is feasible. There is a gap in the market, so we, we heard from them. Um, there's no guarantee anything will happen here, but what this is is a, a market sounding uh, whereby we um, you know, formally find out if there is any interest in this site, and then once we're aware for a live music venue performance space, and once we're aware of what that is formally, um, we can then decide the next steps. The next steps will involve lots of community consultation. Um, so anyone who who may be of the view that perhaps we're not going to consult on this, I assure you that that won't be the case. Um, but it's you know, I'm of the view that we've, you know, we've spent 22 years consulting on this site. We've done consultation till death. We've never actually said, hey, what do people want to see on this site or, or gone out to see if there is any formal interest. I know all previous proposals um, have, have failed because they've just been unachievable. Um, what potentially is proposed here is, is definitely achievable. Um, whether there's interest in it, I guess the only way to find out is to go out to market and, and have some chats with people formally. And what this is doing is asking officers to, to go out um, and speak to anyone who may be interested in this site and come back to us and let us know formally what, what the interest is. And once we have that information, we can, we can decide the, the next steps. I know with, when this originally put up a notice of motions a bit over 12 months ago now, I didn't think it would take this long to come back to us. Um, but I said at the time that yeah, I'm, I'm not interested in another two years of consultation this site, endless consultation on, with all options on the table. I want to be very specific about you know, what it is we're looking for down here and what it can contribute to St Kilda. Also wanted to make sure it wouldn't cost too much. And I think you know, 378000 is a bit of money, but um, I think it's, it's, it's necessary to, to spend on this site. Um, it may be more if, if the people come back to us and say, hey, we need this piece of work done or that piece of work done. Um, before we can proceed, then council will go and go and do that work. Um, but we won't do that work before, because we have done lots and lots of work on this site previously. We've got lots of studies, we've got lots of reports, we've got bookshelves full of um, information, consultants' reports, and things from over 20 years of, of dealing with this site. That we hope um, we hope that the, anyone who's interested can can have a look at, and it becomes. Um, is valuable to them, and if there's something missing, they'll come back to us and tell us what it is. Um, so, you know, this is about moving this project forward. It's about looking forward, and we heard heard from the speakers here tonight that they they all want to move forward uh, and and see an opportunity here. Exactly what that opportunity is, we're not sure, but I think it'd be great if we could move forward and have a look and speak to some people and and see what it is. I, you know, I'm fairly confident that that a live music venue performance space here would be. An acceptable outcome to the community. We've been testing this site over the years with April Sun, with various concerts, with Dinosaur Show down there. So, yeah, you know, we know that this site and the Palais Theatre can function side by side because we've done that um, over the last few years. Our events team have been activating this site with various different things down there. So we know it works. Um, some of the fears that were raised tonight haven't materialised with the events and shows we've, we've been putting on down there. So. Um, this is the next step, and it may all amount to nothing. So, uh, you know, I'm hopeful something happens, but resigned to the fact that, hey, if, if nothing comes out of this and nothing comes back and it doesn't proceed, well, at least we can say we've, we've had a real good look at it and we've given it an opportunity, and it just wasn't there. So um, that's, you know, I hope that's not the outcome, but that's very well could be the outcome. But uh, unless we go and ask the questions, unless we do the work that's required and, and speak to the people who may have have interest here, um, we're never going to be able to answer that question. And that's what I'm hoping to do tonight, is progress this to the point where we can ask the question formally of various people and, and see what interest there is and how we can progress this and with what we can progress this with. Thanks, Councillor Bond. Um, Councillor Sirikov, your speech to the item. Um, I think um, Councillor Bond has covered it all and I uh, totally support everything that he says. He's left nothing for me to say. Good work. Who else would like to speak to the item? Wow. Councillor Martin. First, can I thank Councillor Bond for kick-starting the process? Can I thank the council officers for putting together the documentation? Can I thank Councillor Crawford for widening the scope of the investigation? And yeah, it's, we've let the site lie there as a car park for too long. It's about time to see exactly what our community wants. And as Councillor Bond says, let's hope that uh, we can, in 12 months' time, we're ready to move forward even further. 
And if not, at least we can say we try, but I'm confident that we'll be able to move on. Thanks, Councillor Martin. Deputy Mayor Baxter. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I, I won't be supporting this um, option. I, uh, and in the uh, event that if it happened to fail, I'll, I'll move option one instead. Um, I don't believe that, that stripping away community consultation and uh, environmental uh, technical uh, investigations uh, does, does anything to assist um, what we're attempting to do here. Um, I do have some, some grave concerns, as everybody does at all times, about the triangle and how you could bugger it up, right? So um, I'm, I'm not saying I'm the only one with those concerns. I'm sure everybody has... I'm sure Councillor Bond also has those same concerns. We all have to be very careful about um, how, how we approach this. Um, my my uh, worry is is that we could end up with a situation where we we really go gung ho for for a particular outcome. We get a, a, say a live music venue uh, on there, um, and and that's uh, taken care of. And we don't um, build that into a, 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 an overall view of the triangle as as a community space. Um, that really factoring in how the community would utilise those open spaces um, uh, that are there. And if we... Uh, I, I think that if we rush to just get something done, any, anything, um, that we can end up with, with uh, not, not as bad an outcome, perhaps, as, as uh, you know, um, what, it, what has been proposed in the past, but um, we could end up with just a live music venue and... And, and a whole bunch of other land that we've um, not got the money or the partnership to actually turn into something um, wonderful for our community. So in order for us to properly um, look at this in a holistic way, to package all of these things together and give the best opportunity um, for partnership and funding, we need to do um, the, the right amount of uh, technical work to understand what the, what the constraints around and opportunities around the site uh, are, and we really need to bring the community uh, along with it. We've seen what's happened in the past when the community hasn't been brought along with it, uh, and that is that will that will potentially kill um, uh, what could be a good project uh, if we haven't got the community on side for that. So that's why, um, although I am not totally against this, I would support option one rather than option two. So I'll have to vote against this one. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Baxter. Uh, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm fully supportive of option two uh, to be... I'm not opposed to option one either. However, um, we've spent millions and millions on the St Kilda Triangle to achieve a car park so far. Uh, I'd like to see this project have serious progress during this term of council, which I think everyone's <laughs> in agreement of. And... The one area that seems to constantly come up with conflict is not having a live music or an, another live music venue suitable for things like um, the ones we have down on temporary down there at the moment. So uh, this seems a natural uh, home for uh, the live music venue. Uh, in order to progress this, we need to be a little bit bold and we need to start doing things in a different way to what we have been doing or we'll still be talking about this in another 10 years. So uh, I think now we're talking about getting some outcomes and getting some proposals, which is a fundamental step to actually delivering something. Uh, and option two will do that. Uh, as Councillor Bond likes to say, we've got lots of reports. There's plenty of uh, technical reports that people can probably draw on. I don't think um, by moving to option two, we're ruling out any future uh, technical reports or studies that need to be done. And I don't think anyone could accuse uh, council of rushing into getting a proposal. Uh, I think it would be quite the opposite. So uh, I'm pretty comfortable we're not rushing um, and just moving, actually moving the dial on this. Uh, and what comes back, we're under no obligation to do anything or everything. There's plenty of opportunity to consult on this. We've got a master plan. I think it's 2016 that's just been gathering dust, the ultimate in community consultation that's gone absolutely nowhere. So um, I think this is the right step forward and subject to what comes back, we'll have a lot more conversation. So nothing's ruled out, nothing's ruled in. Um, so I think it's fairly harmless to progress with this. 
Thanks, Councillor Clark. Um, Councillor Copsey. Thank you. I agree with uh, lots of what Councillor Baxter said, so I'll just keep it brief. I, I'm, I desire to see the community's vision realised for the triangle. Um, I share the concerns around if the commercial aspect of that development races ahead, races, I know it's not going to race, but if the commercial aspect of that proceeds and we don't have a plan to realise the vision for the open space, I think that would really be a poor outcome after all the work that's gone um, in. I think um, that the technical, um, <laughs> the technical investigations, painstaking as it you know, is, are actually really consequential for what can be done on the site. Um, I personally think that it's crazy that we continue to insist on um, maintaining a car park in this location. If, if, when you look at the location of this piece of um, land, this beautiful piece of land that's so close to iconic locations in the foreshore, um, I'm really curious about how realistic it is um, to continue to main that, maintain that level of car parking on the site. And I think that the ground and technical investigations are really important to understand for that. Um, so I'm, my, my feeling is that um, if we're to proceed on this, I'd like to do it properly with all the information that we need in order to understand what can be achieved on the site, what can be done underground, what can't. Um, and I think that, the, that option one is kind of the requirement for that. I'm also loath to skip over the initial community consultation given the history of community interest in this site. Um, so Councillor Baxter has already foreshadowed option one, should option two fail on this vote, and I guess I'll further foreshadow um, if neither of those get support, I'll move option three, which is that we continue to wait for the big fish to land for the triangle. Thank you, uh, appreciate that. Who else would like to speak? That's right, Councillor Consola, go ahead. Thanks. I was supportive of a deferral a few weeks ago because I was hopeful that there'd be an even less expensive option that came through. I'd love for this site to be developed to its full potential with a large percentage given to open space, but I have a grave fear as well that it's going to miss the mark and we're going to end up with a really substandard. It could just be a parking lot with a less attractive building next to it. Um, it's a real shame we lost the cultural venue of the NGV. That seemed to be a driving force, something that was going to be built around this. What? No, no, hope, but the potential of it, right? Sorry, we never had potential for it. I also understand we, we have to do work to advance it to find, in order for an outcome to come. So I'm supportive of an appropriate short term, but oh, on that line, the addition in this, I think it's very important that that option of a short-term solution could be there too, because the chances of, of being able to get the long-term solution without all of it lined up, how we're going to deliver the rest of it, is unlikely. So I, I find that a short-term solution could be what we need to do, because landing the big fish, like you've said, is the ultimate goal for this. I don't think we should settle for less. And we're looking for cost savings at this time, so it is very really hard. I don't actually know how I'm going to vote on this. I feel very conflicted on all of it. Not conflicted, but on the fence about it all. Uh, we're looking for cost savings. I don't find this to be a priority spend at the moment, but perhaps an interim, something of that temporary, short-term, not temporary so much, but a short-term solution. If there's interest in a music venue or something like that, there might be an appetite for it. Uh, we have to give it some, a chance, otherwise it's just a car park. But that car park is still the blank slate, blank canvas, that we can do a good thing here. Thank you, Councillor Consolo. Who else would like to speak to the item? Councillor Bond, do you wish to close? Put that motion. Those in favour? Those against? That motion is carried. No problem. Okay, councillors, let's take a rest. Um, it's come back as close to 10 to 10 as we possibly can, please. Thank you. All right, councillors, let's go. We are now going to item 10.5, which is enhancing Elwood Foreshore Site Plan Consultation Feedback. Questions of the officers, councillors? Go ahead, Councillor Crawford. Is there a time frame for when we might get the next draft of the master plan back? Chris Carroll. 
Well, Anthony, you, you, thank you for staying, Anthony. I appreciate that. Anthony, why don't you come and join us? Yeah, try and... Sorry, Chris Carroll. The officers made the trouble to stay here. Go ahead, Anthony. Through you, Mayor, the, um, the timing for returning to council with the revised site plan will depend somewhat on the feedback that we get from councillors. We plan to brief councillors at the next opportunity. And also we would like to, there's some few things we'd like to test uh, with stakeholders other than councillors. Uh, so it will depend on the feedback we get from, from both councillors and the stakeholders. Um, we'll take on board that feedback, revise the site plan and come back to council. That will likely be in a few months, but as I say, it will depend somewhat on the feedback we get from, from councillors. Thank you. Any further questions, councillors? I'm looking for a mover. I'll move. Oh, sorry, Councillor Crawford, you move. I'll second. Councillor Crawford, do you wish to speak to the item? Oh, just um, thanking all everyone for their feedback and thank you for coming tonight um, with feedback. Um, we heard lots of interesting views and, and it was just a starting point to, and now we're going to go away and consider. But it is challenging because not everyone will get everything they want, especially with having to plan for sea level rise. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so there's a long way to go, but thank you for the feedback. Uh, yeah, I don't wish to speak. Deputy Mayor Baxter wishes to yeah, speak. You, you skipped yourself, I think. But um, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, so I, I just want to want to thank the submitters, um, particularly the the um, Elwood Tennis Club, who were who got really uh, engaged, and not just oh, let's send a bunch of angry le uh, letters and, and stuff, which is some sometimes how how, how some uh, groups engage, but instead by reaching out and inviting councillors to come down, and um, and and have a discussion, which I think was 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 a really constructive. And, and, and great way of um, of having that conversation, uh, coming down and eyeballing uh, the place, which is you know it's behind those those fences and and is not is not the most visible um, place in the world. So although there were plenty of other um, stakeholders that councillors have had the opportunity to met, meet with, including myself, I, I just wanted to give it a particular shout out to um, the uh, Elwood Tennis Club and I think also the the Scouts as well. I think have um, uh, been been particularly uh, constructive as well. Um, we. We're definitely going to take that that feedback on board, and uh, I think what we've said yeah. from the beginning okay. is that this is this is an iterative process, and we will be coming back with, um, you know, the, we've got a first draft. We'll come back with further draft, basically, and see what is the best way that we can try and make this area work uh, to meet all the all the, the the needs of the community and our objectives uh, for the site, while also managing things like sea level rise and all, and and uh, you know run down buildings and all of that. Uh, Sort of stuff. So it is very exciting, um, but it's also very early days, and it's uh, and it's good to, to have those conversations. They won't be the last ones for sure. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Baxter. Does anyone else wish to speak? Councillor Sirikov, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank um, the the arrangements the officers made, um, Chris Carroll and Anthony as well, when we actually met with a few of the uh, clubs. Uh, one Saturday afternoon on a freezing cold day and um, I think it was a great opportunity to um, you know, hear their points of view actually on site rather than through an, an email so that they could walk us through their um, issues and what they you know, wanted out of it and uh, whether that be no change or some changes. So I thought that was really beneficial to um, have that experience and um, hear their points of view and also with uh, some of the other councillors who joined on that day. So um, uh, I, I think that, um, yeah, there was a lot to be gained from that and that will be taken into account when we come to uh, f make, uh, making further decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sirikoff. Councillor Crawford, do you wish to close? Okay, I'm going to put that to you, councillors, to the vote. Those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you very, very much. And thank you for staying in the gallery. We appreciate that. Um, councillors, I'll now start rolling through the reports and I'll request to see if some of these items can be put on block if you wish. Uh, can we put the 8.1, the CEO report on block? What do you wish to consider it? Okay, we'll, uh, we'll consider it now. 8.1 CEO um, report. 
Questions of the officers, please. There being none, Councillor uh, Crawford wishes to move and Councillor Pearl a second. Go, go ahead, Councillor Crawford. Oh, I just couldn't be let our CEO's final night go without the report getting a mention. This CEO report has evolved over the term um, that Peter's been here and it has become a much more... Um, uh, I guess, not efficient, but effective way of communicating a lot of things happening in council uh, that we don't always speak about in meetings. So, Peter, thank you for that. Um, so many good things have happened in our municipality, um, particularly like the Common Ground and, and some really exciting legacy items that you do leave behind. Um, and, and some of them hopefully will be realised shortly after, like flooding in Elwood. But all of those things, but there have been some big legacy items. So, um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Councillor Pearl doesn't wish to speak. And Councillor Martin, do you wish to Super speak? Super quick. My favourite read every month is the CEO report. You've set the bar very, very high. Let's see if it gets raised even higher. And uh, I look forward to reading online your reports from your next council, Mr CEO. Great job. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Crawford, do you wish to close? Put that vote to the vote, councillors. That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Now, 10.1 uh, can't be done on block tonight because there's a, a small type of amendment that needs to be placed. There's a, an additional um, document that needs to be placed with the report, which is going to be put up on screen so far as I understand. Uh, a clear map of the area which we're pertaining to. Um, uh, put the park. So, councillors, if you could note that, that would be great. Any questions of the officers on 10.1? I'm happy to move and Councillor Copsey is the second. I don't wish to speak. Councillor Copsey, do you wish to speak? I'll just thank... Um, uh, you know, it's been great to see this space being used and I'm really looking forward to seeing um, us take this next step so that we can formalise it and improve it for future use by the community. Thank you, Councillor Copsey. So no one else wishes to speak to the item. i now put that to, for you to vote. Councillors, those in favour... That's carried unanimously. Thank you. 10.2 will be taken in the on-block section. Councillors, do we wish to add 10.3 to the on-block section? 10.3 is Grand Prix traffic management. OK, we'll add that to on-block. I'm now asking to move to item 10.8, which is Lagoon Reserve Pavilion. Do you wish to move that into on-block? Uh, we do too, we do too. All right. Any questions of the officers on 10.8? Okay, good question. That's a good, <laughs> good question. Let's not ask that question. Right? Um, all right, I'm looking for a mover of this or something else. Uh, Councillor Martin, thank you. And what uh, amendment are you making? Yep. Option three. Oh, there's nothing to be inserted. I thought. Oh, oh easy. I thought it was. Oh, sorry. I thought I had that wrong. There you go. So you moved it. Um, who's seconding it? Uh, I think Councillor Clark had it. Um, all right. Councillor Martin, go ahead. Lagoon Reserve has deteriorated significantly over the last... Well, I've been around there for over 20 years and I've watched it very slowly go downhill and I know there's all sorts of hydraulic issues under the surface. The Pavilion itself is well beyond its use by date. At the same time, we've got a huge population increase coming into Fisherman's Bend. We've got Murphy Reserve already almost oversubscribed. We're desperately in need of a new effective playing space. We're def desperately in need of additional space for sporting clubs and other community groups to meet. So fixing up the, the surface of the soccer pitch there is going to be fantastic and it's going to be a great opportunity not just for all the local clubs but also for all the other community members who will be using it regularly. And if we can put, it, put together a pavilion that's going to meet the needs not just of the local sporting groups but all the other local community groups that are already desperate to find community space, it's going to be a real win. And let's get it right because in previous years sometimes we've taken the slightly less expensive option with some of our pavilions and then in a couple of years' time, we then find it, well, gee, we might need to upgrade. So if we spend the money now, it's going to save a lot more money further down the track. We, this will be future-proof. This provision will be there long after I've left Port Melbourne. Thanks, Councillor Martin. Councillor Clark, do you wish to speak to the item? Uh, just briefly, that this is a much sought-after uh, open space and reserve, and I think it's good to invest in a facility that will uh, last the distance of time and provide options for the many community groups that want to use that space. 
Uh, so, yeah, I'm supportive of this. Thanks, Councillor Clark. Councillor Bond? Um, yeah, just briefly, I think I remember seeing the master plan for this back about 2013 when I first well, got on council. Uh, the reason that didn't go ahead then, it was going to be done and we put money in the budget, but it didn't go ahead because we we're going to do gas works first and that was going to be the overflow for gas works. We would fix up gas works for decontamination and then we'd come back and do Lagoon Reserve the following year. Well, as we sit here 10 years down the track, gas work still hasn't been done. Um, this project was, it was the number one on our list, but it got bumped when there were, in 2014, there were state government announcements for Peanut Farm and then Murphy's Reserve. So those two pavilions and, and sporting fields were behind this one in terms of wanting to be done, but because you know, state government came and announced money, we did the other ones first. So we spent our time on those and once again, this particular site got neglected. So I, th I think it's time we showed this area some love. There is a massive, um, Need for more sporting facilities. You know, yes, these, these may not be full size ovals, but you could certainly get a soccer pitch in there. You could certainly get a junior football pitch in there, and you could certainly get a cricket um, facility in there. And and they all need club rooms, so we need to progress this. So that's just a, a little brief history of the site um, in about two minutes. Thanks, Councillor Bond. Councillor Copsey, go ahead. Oh, everyone's having a go. So just quickly, I'm uh, supportive of this report and I'm really pleased to see the um, investment going into a smaller building footprint but the two-storey option. I thank councillors. It looks like that's where we're going. I think that um, the open space is really, really vital. Um, so I'll be pleased when we can progress this and get a facility that's going to provide a much better um, use outcome and be high, hopefully, I would imagine, very highly utilised by our community. The other thing that I was really pleased to see in this report is the consideration that officers have given to the field surface um, and determining not to go with a synthetic option in this case. Um, I think the... The, the, I'm really pleased to see that we're thinking carefully about that. Um, synthetic surfaces can increase the... Um, playing use of the fields that we have in our municipality, but they can also increase heat island effect, which is a really negative outcome. Usually we'd want to go to our parks to be cool and refreshed, and it's not great when you've got people um, undertaking sporting activities on a hot surface. And the other reason that I'm really pleased that we haven't gone with that in this case is the, the proximity to the marine location um, and the issues that we are now start... I think we're starting to see emerge with some synthetic surfaces... Um, and microplastics and runoff. So uh, I was pleased to see that in this report and glad to support it tonight. Thanks, Councillor Copsey. Councillor Consolo, go ahead. Thanks. A positive for the local dog community has been the delays in all these years and the sports training moving more and more away from this site. Uh, the lights have been an issue for everybody that uses the site, but it's always been, well, the project's coming, we'll sort it out then. So we do need to action this project and to sort out a few options, or sort out those problems. Um, sorry, minutes, three minutes. Now, we do need to share our spaces. Uh, this space, because the dog users have... Um, really enjoyed it. They, this is a, a gathering place. It's now more identified as a dog park than a cricket oval, a, a soccer pitch, all those things. We have to respect that. That has to come through a shining point through this project, that they still exist, they still want to use a space, and we need to balance that. I know that the dogs, you know, one person's dog might urinate and might dig a hole, and that's, no, it's just one dog. But there are also problems with that, that they're there, so we appreciate that they're there and they want to use it, but we also have to, on the flip side, maintain our grounds too. So people have to be responsible owners to make sure that they're not digging, the dogs are not digging, and that they're watching the behavior there so that we can share our spaces because we also run, have to have more sports fields as it grows. So it's a problem with their inner city area. We have less land, but we got to uh, make the most of it. I appreciate that we're going for the larger building, or it looks like we might get the support for the larger building because the population is growing, as people have said, in Fisherman's Bend, etc. And this is the opportunity to do the right size building for that population. So again, just really want to make sure that the dogs are... Um, considered in all this that they can still use the space and that dog owners still respect that this is a sports ground has potential as a sports ground as well thanks thanks councillor consola anybody else wish to speak to the item 
No? Councillor Martin, you wish to close? Those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Uh, that's 10 point, uh, sorry, that's 10.8. So let's, uh, councillors, do you wish 12.1 to be put on block, which is the event strategy and outdoor events policy? Okay, we'll add that to the on block list as well, which just let me check to make sure we've covered off on everything. Uh, we have. Yep. All right. So let me run through what we're uh, under section 33. We're permitted to do um, reports and motions on block. So what we're doing this evening is 10.2, 10.3, 10.4, 13.1, 13.2. Oh, sorry, 12.1. 13.3 and 13.4. Uh, I'm moving that motion. I need someone to second it. Councillor Bond to second. We, we don't usually, it's a procedural motion, so we don't usually speak to a procedural motion, but if anyone wishes to make a comment, I'm happy to allow that. No one does. Okay, I'll now put that motion. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you very, very much. We now move to item 14 which is notice as a motion. And we have three notice of motion tonight. Um, Councillor Bond is 14.1, which is a motion raised in relation to parklets on Fitzroy Street. Councillor Bond, your motion has been tabled in the agenda, so you do not wish to read it out. Um, I'm asking for a second of the Councillor Bond's motion. Yep. And then I'll ask for questions once I've got a seconder, because then I know we're going to consider it. Councillor Clark is seconding. Any questions on this motion to the mover or the or somebody else? Councillor Copsey, go ahead. I had a question for officers, which was around um, some of the comments this evening were around, um, you know, impacts that the parklet is stated to be having on parking occupancy, and I wondered if there if we are doing existing enforcement in that re area. Um, specifically, or if we're not doing enforcement, if we if there's a possibility that officers could respond to that feedback by increasing parking enforcement patrols to help with parking availability. Kyle, Kyle are you able to help us out? Uh, through you, Mayor, I'd need to take that question on notice. Okay, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Any further questions, councillors? Councillor Clark? Uh, I just wondered if there could be any clarification on the policy, I understand the current policy requires approval from a residential, sorry, a retail shop on both sides, given that this is all contained in the one building as an apart, um, body corp and apartments and retail down the bottom. Does the policy currently cover the approvals? Do they have to get approval for a body corporate where it's in the same building or is it just specifically relates to retail shops on either side? Kylie Bennett. Uh, through you, Mayor. Uh, before issuing the uh, extension, so it was a, a temporary permit extension, uh, permit holders were advised that they must supply updated written consent from their neighbours if their parklet encroached in front of another premise. Um, in this instance, uh, the the business owner was not able to gain consent from uh, their neighbour. Um, uh, so that, that's certainly the, the current policy um, that the council has. Uh, but officers are doing a piece of work at the moment, um, doing a review of the business parklet guidelines. Uh, and as part of that uh, piece of work, um, it, and it's also mentioned uh, in Councillor Bond's modus of notion, it is intended to uh, include and have a look at a review of the uh, required consent for residential neighbours as well as business premises. Councillor Clark. Sorry, just to follow up, when you say they talk to neighbours, are they considering a body corporate at all? the apartments that are sitting above when the retail shop is in the same building, if you like, as opposed to neighbours that are on either side of an existing retail shop. Charlie Bennett? Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm no, that's being clear. clear. Oh, well, I think it's clear. Are you clear yeah. on that, Kai? Yeah. Uh, I, I think so. Uh, so through you, Mayor, my understanding is that uh, the team did uh, seek uh, or did ask the business owner to uh, seek the consent from the neighbour, which included the body corporate. Okay. Councillor Bond, you wish to speak to the motion, please. Um, yes, I do. I think, um, first of all, this is, a, is probably a unique situation and it probably goes to Councillor Clark's questions, whereas 
all of these businesses share the address of 145 Fitzroy Street. So when we introduced the policy, I think we envisaged that if you were going to put a parklet in front of 143 or 147, you would need the neighbour's permission. Um, the, these parklets are not actually in front of anyone else's building. They're in front of the business, but they're in front of an entrance to a block of flats which exists at the back and, and above said business. So I think it's a, it's a different situation. There's probably, they're probably co-inhabitants rather than neighbours because they all share the same body court. They all share the same address at 145 Fitzroy Street. And I think that's a, a, probably a little bit of a, an area that needs clarification in our policy and there is work underway to to look at things like this that exist in our policy. Uh, the mo and motion here just says, while that work is being done, if we allow this business to continue with their current three park parklets permits, as per the permit we issued to them to continue through to, um, I think it's the end of December, um, and then their, their permit will be reviewed then and hopefully we will have done the, done the work in time for, for that. Um, the reason these were proposed to be removed is because the, the body court withdrew their permission, um, which, be, which triggered the, the, the removal of these. But I think they should be allowed to continue until the end of the year when their parklet permit that was issued expires. Hopefully we've done the work by then and we have further clarification on what happens here. Um, you know, part of any way forward would, you know, maybe it'll be removing parklets, maybe it'll be we... <laughs> Uh, make some changes to the parking situation on the street to address the concerns of, of, of these residents. Um, I, I know from the time I've spent on Fitzroy Street, cars parking in front of driveways has been happening on Fitzroy Street for 20 years. It's been happening everywhere on Fitzroy Street, not just at this particular address. Um, I, I can't say whether it's, it's now worse because of these three parklets, um, but I just know it has been a constant um, Issue on that street, which you know, one that we as a council probably should resolve with with some um, greater enforcement actions. Um, but I, no, I don't think this this business should be punished because that is occurring because of poor driver behaviour. Um, I know from speaking to, to some of the residents in here, some of the concerns they've raised with this are, are not really parklet concerns. Um, they're more body corp concerns. I know there was concerns with you know, some event that happened in out the front of the business where police happened to be called. I know there were concerns with, you know, um, access to the toilets out the back. The toilets for this event, you've got to go through the driveway internally and, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a complicated situation. I'm sure that's causing um, problems with, for the business and there's also issues with, with bin storage, none of which will be resolved by removing this, this parklet if cars would be parked out the front. I know they, they raise things about deliveries not occurring. Well, I don't think a parklet is, is stopping that occurring. Um, but you know this will be reviewed in three months' time when when this current permit expires, and hopefully we have a better policy or a different policy or a clearer policy in place that can address the the situation as probably you know not side by side neighbours, but upstairs downstairs neighbours. Maybe it's it's something we definitely need to include an apology in, in the policy and say, all right, what's how do we treat that when the when the neighbour upstairs in the same premises that they share together um, objects to the parklet out the front. I don't think that's covered in our current policy. We always envisaged side-by-side -side, um, neighbour's um, situation, but not, not the upstairs, downstairs. So um, all I'm asking here is that we give the business permission to trade until you know, at the end of the permit they've been granted, and then we'll we review this and hopefully fix it with a new policy. Councillor Clark, do you wish to speak? OK. Who else wishes to speak to the item? Councillor Copsey, go ahead. Um, thank you, and thanks to the residents who've been in touch with us about this one. I'm happy to support this motion tonight. Um, I, I do consider that it's right that we um, deal with these once we've these review requests once we have the policy in place. And um, as we've gone into the practicalities of having parklets, they've brought many, many good things to our city throughout um, COVID-19, and I think that they'll continue to really enhance. Um, the vibrancy on our streets uh, and encourage people to come and, and dwell, um, which is exactly what we want well into the future. But, you know, this is where we start to see um, the wrinkles that need to be ironed out um, in a longer term policy. So this has been a really good illustrative case. I also think that um, there are perhaps other uh, options that have been alluded to that might help alleviate some of these problems rather than simply removing the parklet. Um, increased enforcement might assist and also yes I think that um, there might be a case it sounds to look at the parking um, 
types and availability along there, which may help with some of the issues. And for what it's worth, I've also um, noted the amenity and access concerns that residents have raised around this one and sent that through, in, particularly in relation to access and so on. That may um, indicate that there's things that council needs to look at here around accessibility of the footpath and so on. So there may be other ways to um, come at this and happy to support this motion tonight. Thanks. Who else would like to speak? Councillor Sir Sirikoff. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll also be supporting uh, this motion um, because we've only got three more months till um, we come to the end of this period for the parklet policy and it, it will be reviewed. And so to disrupt the uh, parklet at this, at this time seems to be um, inappropriate. Um, and, uh, we can, and then with a new policy coming forward, we can make the right decisions coming out of COVID-19. We can also review um, the situation where uh, parklets are still um, wanted or no longer wanted and how it, adjust, how it affects everybody, uh, uh, particular retailers uh, or businesses um, um, revenue or how successful they are. So I'm really quite happy that um, we just um, com complete this 12-month uh, period or that, so that nobody's uh, disadvantaged at the moment. And um, I'm sure that the uh, residents at, at, uh, at the 145 will then have an opportunity to um, have further feedback when the new policy comes forward. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Sirikoff. Councillor Bond, do you wish to close? Now put that motion, those in favour. It's carried unanimously. Yeah, it's okay. 14.2 um, is a motion by Councillor Bond again in relation to Port Phillip sporting fields. Uh, Councillor Bond, you don't need to read it again. Uh, I'm looking for a seconder. If possible, I'm happy to second. Um, any questions of the officers or the mover in relation to this motion? Councillor Bond, do you wish to speak to your motion? Um, yeah, just I think it's a little bit of supporting information there, but generally um, the feedback from our sporting clubs and park users is that our, um, our current sporting field services need some attention. Um, what this motion does is says come back to us, you know, let's review what is the current state of them. I've walked, I think, all of them in the last, in the last two weeks just to have a look. At, you know, there is a lot of work required to get most of them up to, up to scratch. Um, and... This, this motion says come back to us um, with some information on the current condition, but also come back to us with a you know, schedule. Are we, you know, have, have, are we doing the proper maintenance? Is the, you know, have we scheduled the proper maintenance and it's, and it's not occurring? What is the problem here? Is it, you know, are there other issues at play, yet, play here? I know that Peanut Farm is being heavily impacted by dogs digging up the sporting fields. Um, this is the sort of information we need um, before we decide what we do here in order to ensure that there is uh, an overall improvement in the condition of our, our, our sporting fields um, right across our, our municipality, which is, I think is, is urgently required here when you, know, you go and have a look at the conditions that some of the people play in, you know, in this, you know, Peanut Farm, um, the, the soccer pitch down at Elwood, the soccer uh, oval number two, is a soccer pitch number two at, at Murphy's, those sorts of things there. Yeah, they're just not acceptable um, standards and the standard needs to be improved and the condition of the ground needs to be improved. Um, and it's up to us as councillors to, to put in place the, the steps required to ensure that that improvement does occur. Thanks, Councillor Bond. I don't wish to speak. Councillor Martin. We're very, very, very special here in Port Phillip. We're special because, A, our sporting grounds live in interesting situations. For example, in Port Melbourne, all the pitches there are very, very close to the water table. Peanut Farms, a dog park. In the middle of all this, there's been a dramatic increase, certainly in winter sport use. The number of girls using our sporting fields has probably trebled in the last five and six years. This is scheduled to continue. So given our special circumstances and our greatly increased usage, uh, it would be behoove us to have a very good look at the way we're maintaining our ovals and we can find a better way of doing it and better manage them. This would be a great outcome. Thanks, Councillor Martin. Who else like to speak? Councillor Sirikoff. Uh, something that oh thank you, thank you Mayor um, something that comes to mind when Councillor Bond's spoken about Peanut Farm uh, not so long ago is that sometimes when we do have maintenance um, on these on these um, ovals that inadvertently um, sometimes there can be damage to other utilities on the grounds so uh, which then have long term effects on on the ovals so I'm hoping in this review is that there's a check that um, 
Or ch basically a checklist, um, whatever utilities we do have on those grounds that um, when um, tradies do their work um, fixing the grounds that no other utilities are accidentally impaired in the process and we don't find out about it till six or 12 months later. So um, I, I'm hoping that this review will uh, resolve any of those issues. Thank you very much, Councillor Sirikoff. Councillor Bond, do you wish to close? Put that motion. Those in favour? Carried unanimously. 14.3 is Councillor Bond's motion in relation to Northport Oval capacity. Uh, is there a mover? There's a mover, obviously. Councillor Bond, is there a seconder? Councillor Martin, any questions? Councillor Bond, do you wish to speak to your item? Um, yeah, just recently I was contacted by the football club, Port Melbourne uh, Football Club. Um, they've had a number of games transferred from, from their ground to other grounds because they were informed that their, their current capacity um, was well below um, the anticipated crowd. So a lot of the games, and the games in particular were VFL finals and women's football, AFLW games, were moved to other venues and with crowds of two and a half, three thousand 3,000 people. Now, this is a ground that's been hosting crowds... I think I've been there for probably six or 7,000 people. I'm sure Councillor Martin um, has been there for much larger crowds back in the day um, when VFA football was at its at its peak. Um, so we, we know this ground can, can take it and also recognise that, that standards, acceptable standards, change over the years. So if there are new standards in place that, that, um, the, that, that are currently restricting the capacity of this ground to perform its traditional function, which is hosting football matches. Um, it's up to us as a council, as a landlord here, to, to one, or what are they? Um, officers come back and tell us what those things are, and then we as a council need to decide how we progress. You know, maybe our response is that your crowds are going to be capped, but maybe our response is, all right, we need to build new toilets, we need to build new, um, improve the exits or fix the exits, if that's what it is that's restricting the crowd. Um, rather than just say to the club, well, here's your capacity, that's it, um, deal with it. Um, you know, football is the core function here, so I, I don't think we need to treat this as, as an event. Um, it would be different if they were putting on events here, if they were to put up a marquee on the grass and host a concert or something, that would be an event, whereas a football match is a football match, it, it's core function. I know on the weekend they had to hire... 30 or 40 portable toilets. It costs the club $5,000 to do that. And if they've got to do that every week, um, it'll, it'll soon eat away at the, the funding of the club. Um, you know, it, us as a council, we need to work out right, what is it that's required here? How do we as a council address that as the landlord for there, as the, you know, the body that's ultimately responsible for that ground? I, you know, I don't think we should be shifting... Um, the responsibility or the to the club here in this in this particular instance and say well let 's treat this as an event and, and you deal with it um, you know it is football we we 've built those new lights we 've built in new change rooms we 've built an event center we we 've done lots of things to try and attract people here. I just think it 's probably the wrong step for us as a council to say, well, now you can only have a thousand and eighty people or fifteen hundred people there um, given we 've built all these things that that are designed to attract crowds of much, much more. So this is saying, look, you can have up to 6,000 people, but also saying, hey, come back, officers, come back to us and tell us what, do, what does this ground need? What do we need to do as councils, councillors, as a council to, to ensure they have everything they need in order to, to operate sufficiently at this ground for matches like this, which are going... Uh, we, we're hoping to have more and more of moving forward at this particular ground, so that's what this motion does. Councillor Martin. So Northport Oval is the oh, dual... question, sorry? I'll go for a question. Sorry, you can ask a clarifying question any time. Sorry, I thought you, you wanted your, to speak. Before you get your head of steam up, Councillor Martin, sorry. I just had a qu clarifying question. I'm wondering, the, the wording of this motion speaks about Port Phillip Council imposed restrictions. Um, and I just wanted to seek clarification from officers around whether... Um, Restrictions on numbers and so on at this ground are due to Port Phillip Council imposed restrictions or other factors. I'll ask the officers to respond first, if that's possible. Alison, thank you. Um, through you, Mayor. Um, uh, event uh, numbers are based on the infrastructure that's in place on a permanent basis, so that's set by national standards. 
and then there's additional standards if you want to go outside of that. So for North Port Oval, the standard infrastructure supports 1,500 patrons. If you want to hold events that have numbers in excess of, say, up to 6,000, there are regulations that guide uh, the infrastructure and planning that has to be put around that. They're not set by council, they're national standards. So there's a requirement for the motion to be... Oh, so well. go on, yeah. Um, question is, our sport and recreation officers sent the club an email based is on the advice... Is it a clarifying question yeah, to the motion? Well, it's a follow-up It's to not that. really a clarifying question well, it, to the motion. It goes to the point... It does go to the point of okay. um, Port Phillip Council imposed restrictions. Our sport and rec people sent the club an email based on advice from Port Phillip's municipal building surveyor that the and capacity the at is? the ground was 1,080 people. Is that correct? So through you, Mayor, my understanding is that's correct on the basis of the infrastructure that's currently in place. The uh, patrons um, with the current infrastructure, with no temporary infrastructure being in, um, would hold up to 1,500 patrons. I don't want to spend the next 15 minutes looking up to justify what I'm about to say, but the notice of motion needs to, a needs to accurately reflect what's happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest you change the notice of motion. Uh, Impose restrictions to, if you can remove the word Port Phillip Council. Uh, I would then deem it as being accurate because it, it, it might. I don't think it can accurately be said that Port Phillip Council is going is imposing the restrictions. They're implementing. We're, we're doing what we do in all sorts of different arrays here potentially, and and just doing what our role is and is applying applicable law. Uh, what if we change the wording to the restrictions as advised by Port Phillip Council? Uh, that I'll get some advice. That would be accurate. I'm, I'm going to move an amendment. Uh, just let me get some advice, if that's all right. First time ever. Sorry. Yeah, I'm going to move an amendment, impose an amendment on that's on the screen, which is deleting. So removes the current. Yep. Correct. And I'm looking for a seconder to my amendment. Councillor Consolo. So my amendment is to remove the word Port Phillip Council imposed. Uh, the reason I'm moving this amendment is so that the um, mover of the motion can move forward with confidence to ensure that it's applicable to the government rules and it provides clear uh, insight and direction to the officers on what to act upon. Um, I don't wish to speak any further. Councillor Consolo, do you wish to speak to the amendment? Anyone else wish to speak to the amendment? No, I don't wish to close. I'll put that amendment to you. Those in favour? Those against? The amendment is carried. It now becomes part of the substantive motion. All right, where were we? Councillor Bond has spoken to the motion. That's fine. And I've just broken the government. Have I broken the government's rules? I'm not meant to move an amendment before the second. Oh, no, it's been moved in second. I'm, I'm in the clear. Right. Councillor Martin, go ahead. So North Port Oval's the jewel in the crown of our sport and rec, and it's been there for many, many, many years. And not only is it a wonderful sporting arena that we've just spent an enormous amount of money in conjunction with the state government in upgrading, but it brings lots and lots of people and lots and lots of business into the city of Port Phillip. And you only need to go to the Clare Castle before or after a game on a Sunday afternoon to see the amount of money that comes into Port Phillip. So it's actually something that attracts money into our municipality. So anything that we can do to encourage people to attend sporting events there is something that I believe we should do. Um, as Councillor Bond mentioned, um, I've been there since before any of you were born, going to football matches since the early 60s. And there was a tradition of having very large numbers of um, spectators there. And it, it, apropos the previous motion that uh, was carried just a few minutes ago, probably we need to be, as a council, well aware of the restrictions on any ground so that we don't give surprises to people. And the close, more closely that we work with our local sporting clubs, the less chance there are of surprises happening. And there were some surprises there the other day. I gather things are now sorted. This is great. But long term, given that this venue is attracting not just people to play elite sport, not just being home to the major home of women's football in the southern suburbs, but is also attracting people from outside our municipality on a regular basis during the winter, it behooves us, I think, to 
make some little investment in the facilities there long term to ensure that we can continue to do that. And yes, it's reasonable to ask the local club to bring in portaloos if they need portaloos, but it may well be that we as a council decide that we might need to upgrade or improve the toilet facilities there because the North Port, or sorry, the, the Port Melbourne Football Club may, may not be the long term custodians of the ground. We're the actual landholder there, and it's probably up to us to provide those facilities long term. And I would strongly suggest that any investment in the facilities there will pay off, I can't tell you how many times fold, fivefold, tenfold, by the amount of money and goodwill that flows into the City of Port Phillip as a result. So it's a win for everyone if we make sure that the facilities enable us to keep reasonable crowds at North Port Oval. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Who else wishes to speak? Councillor Copsey, go ahead. Thank you. I'm a bit in two minds. I don't know if I'm going to support this this evening around this, but um, thank you to councillors um, for supporting that amendment. I just want I just want this to be accurate around the source of um, the requirements no. um, for particular oh. crowd sizes and so on. And I didn't think that the wording as submitted. Uh, you know, I think that. Um, I think that that wording was probably um, accurate around the inquiry that's like spurred this notice of motion to be lodged, but I think we've had further information um, certainly presented to councillors um, prior to tonight's meeting that means that, yeah, this wording is a bit more accurate. Um, I think, sorry, <laughs> trying to gather my thoughts, it's very late. Um, The thing, the thing is, you know, some of the supporting information we do, we do maintain these grounds for the Port Phillip community, and I guess that this is another salutary lesson where if our grounds are going to be be being used for elite and statewide sport, um, in addition to local community need, um, then that can really create. It has a lot of benefits for our community, but it also creates a larger uh, burden on the infrastructure than what would be um, attracted with normal community use. I'm not opposed to us having a look into this and I think one of the reasons I'm um, toying with you know, not voting for this is I don't know that the motion is actually required. I feel that officers are already, undertake, are already um, looking at the situation here and, and will come to council with any um, recommendations around things without us requiring a motion. Um, but also I think if uh, these requirements on the facility are emanating from um, big attendance from professional uh, sport, um, then that may not necessarily fall to the City of Port Phillip to foot the bill for. So I'm happy for us to investigate this, but if, um, you know, it, it may work, work out to be more efficient for those occasional uses for us to bring in additional um, temporary infrastructure, uh, or it may be that this is something that we seek a partnership on if, if there's going to be an ongoing need for these um, facilities that might be in excess of what our local community needs. So um, thank you, Councillor Bond, for investigating this. I just want to be really sure about where the requirements are coming from uh, you know, and whether or not that means that we need to have... a another large investment in this sporting field. Thank you, Councillor Copsey. Deputy Mayor Baxter, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I won't be supporting this motion. I, um, I, I was uncomfortable um, from the moment I saw it in terms of the way that it came about um, in that uh, this was uh, a councillor who was unhappy with the way that officers were, were dealing with the situation and said, I'm just going to bring it into council and, and tell you how to, how to do it. Um, I think that's a really poor process. I think that's a really poor way to um, uh, manage some of these complex uh, issues. Um, while I, uh, I support the, the idea that we, um, that we should do what we can to try and make sure that... Um, uh, the, the the crowds can increase at at North Port Oval and, and particularly pay attention to the the historical precedent um, that there has been. We also have national standards that it's our officers' job to try and enforce, right? So, um, I, I basically I, I would support um, number two on this uh, notice of motion, which is about reviewing it and seeing how we can support North Port Oval to actually have. Um, the the numbers of uh, attendees that uh, that 
um, could be there if they if, if if they had more infrastructure there. Um, that, but I think blanketly just saying we're going to permit crowds of six thousand people when our national standards and the way that our staff actually implement them is is at odds with that. I think is a, is a poor way to manage this situation. I think it's it sets a bad precedent for how we manage the way our staff deal with um, other stakeholders. Uh, and I would much rather we just. Uh, look at how we can how we can support um, North Port Oval uh, as a location and uh, and of course Port Melbourne Football Club as a stakeholder at that location uh, going forward with in terms with crowd numbers. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Baxter. Councillor Consolo. Thank you. All respect to the officers and working on this one. I was really shocked to hear the capacity stated earlier with the fifteen hundred. Uh, I think there's a sense of urgency, and that might be motivating this, that there are events that are being affected by this change in capacity. Maybe it was just assumed that we had a higher one, and now that number is laid out based on some situations, circumstances. But uh, it's my understanding that uh, it's been revised around the, the gates have been fixed or sorted out a little bit more, that that 6,000 is feasible. Now the, the problem is the toilets, and that's another thing that just gets triggered by capacity. And... I have yet to stand in a queue there, even being in the large numbers. So it is interesting, you know, if, if we have to add the port... Sorry. I look forward to hearing the information come back because this is important to sort out for this venue. And uh, I look forward to hearing how we're going to do that. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Consola. Anybody else wish to speak? Councillor Bond, do you wish to close? Um, yeah, just to clarify a couple of points. It's, it wasn't me that was unhappy with the situation. It was the... 150-year-old Port Melbourne Football Club that was unhappy with the situation, and I'm, I'm just acting on their behalf. Um, yeah, if you want an example of, you know, I know with the motion's now been amended, but it was us that told them that the capacity was 1,080. Um, and my expectation would be that when that occurred, I, I would before we went back to them, I would say that. Um, right, council officers would look at that and say, right, what can we do to address this? Rather than just say no to the club and say, you can't have it, what would we do to fix it? And one of the things we could have done um, straight away when we notified them was fix the gates that were broken or welded or whatever that was causing the capacity limitation um, based on insufficient emergency exits at the ground or insufficient space for people to exit the ground. Well, Miraculously, the moment I submit my notice to the motion, we, we were able to get down there and fix those gates, even though they'd been broken for for a very, very long time. I w my expectation would be that we'd go and fix that before we told the club, say, all right, here's a problem here, let's go and fix the gate and, and, and take that off the off the table and then deal with what else is left instead of just saying to the club, hey, this is your capacity, you know, up to you to fix it, which is which, what we did in this instance, which I, which I don't think is meeting the expectations of of service delivery to our to our clubs and our tenant clubs and you know, all the organisations that we are landlords for. So that's just one example of, of where I think we... There's an area for improvement in our dealings with these clubs and you know, as a result of our current dealings with them, you know, they, they weren't happy and contacted me and I'm sure they contacted Councillor Martin as well and probably other community-minded councillors were, were contacted also by them. So I'm here... Um, directly as a result of the feedback given to me directly by the club with a problem they had and I'm addressing that problem and, and it needed to be addressed urgently because they have more games coming up and can't afford to have any more of their games transferred to, to other grounds throughout Melbourne as a result of the capacity limitations which is why we're here tonight and why this, this can't wait. So Now put that motion, those in favour, those against, that's carried. Let's now move to item 15, which is a report by council delegates. Councillors. Thank you. Uh, councillors, item 16, urgent business. Do councillors have any items of urgent business? No? Okay. Item 17 is confidential items. Councillors, we have two confidential reports listed on the agenda this evening. I now call upon a councillor to move the, the meeting to be closed to the public. Uh, Yeah, I'll do it now, do it now, it's fine. Uh, through you, Mayor, I should probably declare this early, earlier in relation to item, 
item 17.2, which involves an M9 matter because I have a future employment contract with an M9 council. I'm, I'm going to declare an interest and potentially a conflict of interest. And out of caution, I will absent myself from that item. So I'm now moving that we close the meeting to the members of the public to deal with the following matters pursuant to section 66.2 of the Local Government Act 2020. I'm looking for a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Sirikoff. Now put that motion to you. That's carried. Thank you. Um, I don't have the words here, but if we could, uh, we're now going to close the meeting to the public and close the doors. Thank you all for coming and thank you those that have joined us online. Good evening.